task force. Um, not to say the whole name because I don't think we need pension task force. Uh, it is July 22nd, 22nd, great. And here we are. And um, so let's get going. Um, John, who, who would like to walk us through these? John, is that you or Sarah or? Let's, uh, let's, I, let's take a moment to just ha have, give folks an opportunity to review oh, last meeting. Oh, okay. First. You so want to there were first. Any Good. questions, any yep. um, you know, things that you needed more information on or task force mm -hmm. discussion about last, yep, the yeah, last meeting. Uh, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all back here today. Uh, before we get too far into the agenda, I think it's great that we always have this time to reflect back on previous meetings, just to kind of look at it. And so far, we've had two meetings um, through this process, and we have really important work to ahead of us. At the first meeting, it was mentioned that we need to have honest conversations with each other and that we're here as a group of individuals, not separate factions. Um, and I think those are ideas that we can all get behind or in, in support of. Since our last meeting, I had a chance to talk with Molly and Eric, Kate, Leona, and Dan, um, just about how things have been going so far. Um, and as we were starting to reflect together, we noticed we had some similarities um, in our thoughts so far. And we'd like to take some time this morning to address the entire group with kind of our shared thoughts. And um, we're gonna have a variety of topics we'd like to look at from agendas to our duties um, covering Act 75 as a task force. Sure. Do you want to do that now or do you want to add that to the agenda to have that conversation? Uh, I'd love to go through it now because I sure. think there's parts where if we sure. go through it now, there might be time then to be like, okay, well, yes, we actually need to address this now, but later in the agenda also and possible retweak of the agenda, um, especially near the end of the day. Okay. And, and I will just remind us that um, because being on YouTube, it's very tempting for us to think that we're talking to those people out there in the world, and we're not. We're talking to 13 of us here, and it is pretty awkward that we sit in this kind of long line here, but um, there, there have been some instances, not here on this task force, but where, where um, people in meetings, uh, seem to be addressing a larger audience out there and not talking to task, other task force members. So just so we all remember that who it is that is taking part in this conversation and is actually part of the conversation, just a reminder. So, to, so yeah. Awesome. Um, Dan, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure. Um, I, I guess for me, just looking at things, uh, I guess going forward, it, it seems like it's important as a uh, as a committee and a group. Uh, does it make to me? It makes sense to maybe formalize the process a little bit more in the sense of um, creating an agenda at the end of a meeting uh, together uh, a little bit more. I know you've been asking, what do you want put on the agenda? But to me, it just um, makes more sense uh, to try to all of us come to a whether it be with a vote or uh, whether it be just uh, some type of uh, agreement amongst all, just some of the things to put on the agenda uh, and do it again. Just for me, it's like, what is the what is the process of us making a decision? Uh, you know, more does it have to be more formal uh, in those sense of uh, in the sense of the committee? Um, and if uh, it it also seems we've we're two meetings in. Uh, but I'm not really sure on where the, you know, really as, as a committee, what, what is our focus? Uh, you know, I, I know the last time they did this, they set up some guiding principles and these are the principles that we're going to follow. So again, uh, to me, it just seems to make sense that for us to move forward, we kind of, should we formalize principles of, of, of what we as a, a task force find to be important because that's going to be really what our goalpost is when we start making decisions and start voting and start trying to decide what we think is uh the best uh path forward uh on this and, and how are we going to do that so i think that's important for us to, to to sit down and take some time uh whether it be at the end of today or set it up on an agenda at the next 
you know, just take some time to really think about, you know, what, what are the principles that we all can agree are important for this and, and what are the things that we're going to do to, to push this forward and, and take the path that we all agree on where it needs to go and, and what we're going to do. So for me, like I said, just general, just it may be more of a formalized process uh, going forward. Uh, to, uh, not, not that it, it is that, but I personally have heard from others. It just, it seems like we're here uh, and it's, 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 it's the perception out there that it might not be as formal as uh, and open as it was uh, said to be. So. And Kate, did you have a part that you would like to add in also with regards to agenda or um, reports? Yeah, we just feel very strongly that we're in the point where we should be creating the agenda together using time at the end of the meeting to, to be able to do that and also um, how we're going to to address all the charges that are in front of us. Uh, we just feel like um, that would be a better way to, to have shared voice in the process. And Leona, um, can you speak to, we're, we've been talking about witnesses coming um, and joining us. And I know Leona was hoping to speak about that this morning. Um, so really in regards to the witnesses, we've had some great um, you know, testimony from the Joint Fiscal Office and that has been very informative and very helpful. And we're just looking forward to a, a variety, more variety of witnesses as we go along in the process um, outside of just the JFO office. So that would be awesome. So can I ask a question about that? Is when we made the list of who we needed to hear from, yeah. that we that's a kind of a growing list yes. that we would keep adding to. Yeah. So and we also have at the end of today mm -hmm. some conversation about the pro the public input process. And how that's we awesome. Yes, Th thank you for adding that to the agenda. Um, and also I really thank you for sending out that list of information you know, bringing together um, what we've all talked about. I thought it was really helpful to, to take a look at that and, and see not only what we've discussed, but kind of start to see a path forward. And uh, I thought that was great. Um, I, I was reflecting on the, you know, our agenda item last time about the report and we focused on the recommendations um, and there's a great section at the beginning about the guiding principles, speaking to what, what Dan said. Um, and we're going to have, uh, you know, more talk of recommendations today. I just want to make sure we make the space to um, the, the um, organization of this task force is very unique in that it's uh, a diverse stakeholder group. And I just want to make sure we, have, we make the space to um, chart our own path. And I think what would really be helpful is, you know, maybe next um, uh, next meeting, we could take a look at, again, at our charge and take a look again at that list and kind of put together a work plan of, um, uh, you know, okay, we should have a meeting dedicated to this topic. Mm -hmm. and, and this, you know, these are the experts we'll, you know, we'll bring into that meeting. Um, it's going to take a little time to bring the actuary and professional services on board. And, you know, I think we can use that time to really put some context around the numbers that will eventually come back from the, uh, the, the professionals, the actuary. Um, so I just want to encourage us to make some time for that to think about collectively um, how we want to meet our charge. And we need to make sure we bring Frank bear on that because the information list that was sent out in between meetings was a really good start. On that, so I really appreciate that. Thanks. So I think to kind of wrap up that part, I mentioned possibly looking at the agenda, recognizing that we already have some people scheduled today and respecting their time. Um, but if there's no objection to setting uh, 20, 25 minutes at the end today where we can all work collaboratively on the agenda, um, I'd like to. I don't know if we need to make a motion to accept that. We spoke about formalizing the process potentially, but um, getting agenda creation on as a task force um, today at the end will be great. Okay. I um, understand the need to be more formal and to make motions and stuff. I'm not sure that. that um, I feel the necessity to do that because it, in my mind, it it um, 
it makes it less less uh, conversational and and I I feel strongly that this these thirteen people should be here talking to each other and and not um, I guess uh, this is more the size of one of your committees so it's harder for me to imagine how how you operate that way but on our committees we have we only take a vote when we have to show an act i mean if there's otherwise we just have discussion I'm, I'm and, and, I, that. and I, I guess i would just add to that that the the request for us to be more collaborative with building the agenda is is mm -hmm. you know received and, and yeah we we agree we're fine i mean yeah. it was a little hard from day one to build that agenda when um, you know, when there was clearly a body of background information that we all needed to cover together. And as, as we have moved through these first couple of weeks, I hope, I hope you recognize in the agendas, the requests that we've heard from you about what you want to cover. And we can certainly, um, take the last, you know, that mm -hmm. last, yeah. uh, time on our agenda today to talk about the agenda for the next meeting. And we can tell you what what we've already lined up in response to previous requests, and we'll figure out how we fit that in together. That would be excellent. That yeah. sounds great. Yeah, I think I think what you know for me personally, I think we'll just I, I think what we'll find is after you know a couple of meetings, we we've, we've all kind of got our feet wet. Uh, I personally am not a you know. This is not something I do every single day. So just getting used to, to, to everyone here and, and getting more comfortable with uh, being in the room with everyone and, and doing that. Um, so I, I think as time goes on, uh, we'll certainly uh, be more upfront and, and speaking more to, to what we're thinking and, and saying um, and going. So like I said, for me, that just seems to be uh, where we are right now. Just we're getting comfortable um and uh in, in speaking with with everyone outside of this and, and, and also with you uh i think everyone takes this this charge very seriously uh and i, I don't think anyone here you know we we, we have spent a, a lot of time in the last few weeks just getting together as a group talking about this and, and understanding it and really understanding it so uh if anything i hope that's the biggest uh message that we can put out there is is that not that you don't either, but I, I know for the six of us, we take this extremely seriously and we want to just make sure uh, at the end of the day when we vote, we're, we're all comfortable with what the result is. So. I, I couldn't agree more, and, but, but I do, I do want to say that I hope you're not thinking of this as us and you. No, no, not at all. Because, no. because that, that shouldn't be the yep. case at all. We are not, I mean, there are um, six, um, union representatives here and um, six other others, but it's not, it's not this group and this group. Oh, no, and that's, that's, that's not, a, okay. and I, if that's okay. the sense, I didn't mean that, that's okay. not the sense at all. It's just us getting together because, uh, you know, we just, we have different, um, you know, we have different views on things and, and I, I, you know, with Andy and, and Eric and Kate, they all have different views than I have. Right. Um, so it's just kind of us understanding each other and knowing where we're all coming from um, and making sure that, uh, you know, we understand where you're coming from and, and uh, understanding that we're all heading in the same direction. And I would hope that those conversations would be part of this group of sure. where we're yep. coming from, not, not in separate groups, yep. because, because if because we all need to be here and engaged and mm -hmm. so i i really want to make sure that we're not thinking of this as sides yeah yeah no, at all, no. in any way and our point of bringing up this topic this morning was to ensure that it's not separate sides that it's us working collaboratively that we're yeah. working on the agendas together yep. that we're making decisions together that we're deciding on witnesses together we're talking about panelists talking about public hearings again um, as a group. So that's yep. why we're bringing this forth because we want to make sure that that we are all here together. Mm -hmm. yep. It occurs to me while I'm sitting here, I'm taking myself back 30 years to wilderness trip leading, but it's like we're doing the norming part of group formation, which is, you know, you, you form and then you norm. So we're creating the norms, right? And then there's storming. We got to look out for that. Part. <laughs> <laughs> and then you move into performing. Okay. I think this is Knowles. I'm not sure, but um, I do have one little piece that's perhaps a little bit of storming, 
Um, <laughs> so put on your seatbelts um, that I wanted to offer from the last meeting, which was that um, there was one point when we were talking about the hearings and um, we were, we, were, we were discussing whether or not to have hearings and perhaps the timing of the hearings. And a comment was made about um, how li listening to testimony when people didn't understand the problem. And I just wanted to raise that that didn't sit super easily with me because um, there was an assumption that the, the people who were testifying may not have understood the problem. And while I totally agree that um, most of those, those of us who were testifying, I was one of them, <laughs> um, were very busy doing other things, teaching, um, et cetera, or in their, their jobs and not looking over the budgets and that sort of thing in the same way and with the same level of depth that our, our public servants in this building were. Um, I think that there was an understanding of the problem and it made that comment as I sat with it over the last week or two has, made me wonder if we have a common understanding of the problem yet or whether we still have multiple perspectives about what the actual problem is and i think it might do us well to stir up some of the storming you know stir up some of the issues that led to the conflicts in the late winter months and early spring months where teachers and public employees felt the need to come forth and say no, that can't happen. Um, and, and find out what's behind that. Because, you know, from my perspective, I understand that there's a huge part of the problem that has to do with money um, and managing money over the next 18 years. And I simultaneously feel like there's a huge part of the problem that has to do with um, workforce and making sure that we're able to attract and retain and maintain our services for all Vermonters. And so I want to make sure that we're defining the problem holistically and that we're really honoring the stories of those people who can bring us other perspectives so that they're sitting at this table with us, through us, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and I think that that was part of, that was um, the intent behind giving all the information that came from JFO and that today is going to come from the treasurer's office. So that, and that the, our goal was, I think we talked about last time, is that we will come up with a, I don't know if you want to call it principles or what, but a common understanding. This is, this is the issue that we're dealing with and that we would all agree on that issue. And, and I think we talked about even when, if we have, whenever we have any kind of um, public input or public hearing or however, however that happens, that we would have that sheet available so that people, so that there's an understanding that this is what the issues are, not, not recommendations at, this, at that point, but just a common understanding that all 13 of us have, that this, these are the issues we're dealing with. And so that we can, I, I believe that's what we talked about yes. last time in uh, coming up with that. And that was, so we've been trying to lay the groundwork mm -hmm. for, so that we all have a better understanding. And there, there is a lot of misinformation out there. Mm -hmm. And by, in every, in, in the workforce, in the legislature, mm -hmm. I mean, there's misunderstanding of what the issues are right. everywhere and misinformation. So we're trying, I think that that was our goal in having, laying the groundwork here so that we all had a common understanding and agreed upon that common understanding. Yeah, and, that, and that's, a, that's a perfect goal. And I just also want to acknowledge that, you know, for myself, I'll speak for just myself, you know, I can get triggered when I think about the recommendations from House GovOps last spring. You know, I can get triggered and I have to like do my work and say like, yep, that's behind me, I'm moving forward, you know? And I think that's possible, possibly there for other people as well. And if we can just own that that elephant is potentially in the room, that will help us become a team that's moving forward, you know? Yeah, I think that's why I think that we need to, everything is on the table, Yeah, everything, but we have a common understanding, but the, whatever recommendations have been made by anybody in the past are gonna be on, on the table. 
-hmm. and um, the recommendations from 2009 and recommendations that Dan wants to throw out or Kate or whatever, wherever they come from, mm -hmm. they'll be on the table. But I don't think that we should lock ourselves into, into um, responding to something that has been put out before, uh -huh. if that makes sense. Because some of them may be the same, some of them may not be the same. Well, that's for this these 13 people. And we're downstream. Yeah. And, and we're downstream, you know, we're moving forward. Right, right, yes. So whatever, whatever happened before is back there. And um, well, it may trigger responses. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we can take a deep breath mm -hmm. and say, okay, I got it, we're past that. that that's really refreshing to hear. Um, it's, you know, I think that dovetails well with uh, kind of what I was saying about creating this space for our own um, work and our own recommendations. Yeah. Um, and I think in terms of, uh, you know, coming to a, a common understanding of the problem, I think as a, as a task force, we're going to have, we have the responsibility of, of laying that out mm -hmm. in the report that we put out at the end of the day um, so that it is, so that people can digest that. Um, I, I, I think that's a that's a great goal. Anything else about? Uh, yeah. Just one final piece, and this one might be slightly silly, but um, yeah, I'm so in my class. Silly is good. So, silly is good. That's how I operate in school. <laughs> silly is very important. Um, I spend the first six weeks and really throughout the rest of the year in my classroom setting routines and expectations um, and rule creation together. So my perhaps silly question is. I'm honestly not sure how to refer to everybody at this table. What would everybody like to be called? Um, Jeanette, Sarah, Molly, Michael, Eric, Eric. John, Kate, Leon, Dan is fine, Corey. Is fine. I prefer Andrew um, as opposed to Andy, but <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> Michael. Andrew, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. That was. Thank you. Yes, yes cuz I've noticed that some people say senator parent or senator white and I just I think that we need to think of ourselves as 13 people instead of um any title. Okay. Right. I just finally learned to Well, you can say it under your breath. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. That was helpful. Thank you. So now let's look at the RFPs here that we have to um, for our future work. Um, let's see, there is um, a draft of a letter to the treasurer's office just um, uh, asking for more information. So do you yeah. want to go through so that? I can take, take everybody through. So I worked with um, Legislative Council, Joint Fiscal Office, and also with Michael. Um, for the treasurer's office and putting this letter together. Um, so it identifies the scope of work. And I think at our first meeting, we all agreed that we would use a Siegel group um, as the actuary for the task force. Uh, so this just identifies the scope of work. It doesn't have Siegel starting to initiate any of this work at this point. That will be up to the task force to decide when the work begins. Um, but this at least identifies for the treasurer and for Siegel the type of work that we want um, to go. And that's listed in the second paragraph in the numbered order one through five, um, which is tied to act 75. Um, I think I'll just go through it quickly because that's the, the key component of the letter. Um, the first uh, issue is the cross subsidization between research groups. And just so people understand that issue, there was a, a study done by the former actuary in 2009 um, which may be inaccurate, but indicated um, that there was subsidization by Group F um, to all the other groups that make up um, research. So that was at least the information at that point in time. And so part of Act 75 requests that we look at that issue um, again. Um, do we so have? That, do, I don't mean. Do we no, have ahead, access Dan. to that? Do we? Did we get that? Or is um, no? I that? have a copy, um, okay. and I can make copies um, for yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it's 
you know, in talking to or actually emailing with Michael the other day, um, there doesn't seem to be any basis for the contribution levels for the various groups that make up research right now. Um, so, I mean, that's something to look at. I mean, there, there are, and I should also say there's a lot of subsidization in pensions. Um, for example, mortality. Um, somebody who dies at 65 is going to be subsidizing somebody that dies when they're 95. Sure. Um, so subsidization is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to understand it and that there's transparency around it. Um, and I think this is one area where at least some people felt that there wasn't a lot of transparency. Sure, absolutely. Um, so that's the first issue. Um, the second is various possible changes to VSERS and VSERS pension benefits, contributions, and retiree health benefits. So without us, you know, we can come up with any recommendations we want. But unless an actuary actually looks at those and analyzes them, we will not know the costs or benefit to them. So obviously, if we come up with different recommendations to change benefits or contribution levels, we would need the actuary to determine how those impact um, the two pensions. Um, so that's the second one. Various methods of amortizing VSERS and VSERS pensions and retiree health, retiree health benefits. So currently, um, the pensions are amortized. And I, I think, you know, Chris Roop from GFO explained how they're amortized. Um, there are different amortization methods. And so that may be something that we want to take a look at. Right now, the amortization increases by 3% a year until 2038. Um, so, you know, that is something that is just one method of amortization. There are other methods that pensions can be amortized to. And with respect to retiree health benefits, right now, that's funded on a pay-go basis, so there is absolutely no amortization, though the treasurer's office did prepare two documents um, that we can share with you with respect to how you would amortize that, which is how you would go about pre-funding um, retiree health benefits. Hey, John. Yes. Can I just add a point of clarity? Sure. So I think that relating, you're referring to the unfunded portion of those benefits, not the benefits themselves. And maybe just add that in for clarity that it's amortizing the unfunded portion of the benefits, the pension and health benefits. It's, it's the amortization schedule determines what our ADAP payment is. Um, so it's, it's, and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's, it's amortizing the normal cost plus any unfunded liability. So there's an element beyond the unfunded piece. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right, great. Yeah, I think what Michael was getting at is um, the, the unfunded liability is the part that's captured in the amortization schedule. The normal cost, um, that, that, that's calculated every, every year. Yeah. Um, so just the distinction between the two. Okay. Uh, it's really just for clarity if you think it's clear. Then... Okay. Um, I think Eric. Uh, Eric, go ahead. Um, a question as well. Um, the the funding policy in number four. Um, what do you envision that capture? Well, that would look at everything. Um, okay. But you know, if there we did decide that there was new funding sources um, or different ways of paying for the pensions, um, such as you know changes to benefits, changes to contributions. Mm -hmm changes to the way we pay it, um, that would be looking at the total way we would fund it. Um, and that is something that if you look at some of NASRA's information, um, that is one of the things that, you know, they suggest that if you're making significant changes to pensions, um, that you look at the overall funding um, methods. So, so this would also capture the impacts of one-time dollars or uh, new revenue um, de dedicated to the, yes. the, the pension. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I'm just should instead of funding policy, should funding sources? Should that be would that be that I don't is that more clear, Eric? I don't know if that's what you're getting at. Well, it's it's not just the funding source, yep. it's just an overall funding policy okay. um, of how you go about funding them. And it's not necessarily just looking at say new money or one time money. Um, it's looking at the overall way of figuring it out. And that includes like you know, how does an amortization schedule impact funding? Sure. Um, because okay. if we were to propose changing that, that would change the way we would be funding it. Sure, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, then the final one is the impact of any pre-funding arrangements for OPEB. Um, so that's just, uh, that was added by the treasurer's office. And um, 
it, you know, that's just, you know, again, it's looking at how you amortize um, uh, retiree health benefits and what the overall impact is um, to funding those. Make sure we capture that. So those, that's basically the scope of work. Obviously this task force would have to um, come to agreements on, on any of these. I will have to say that with respect to the, the, the cross subsidization issue, we don't have to necessarily do any work there. That would be something we could just ask the, the actuary to look at because that's looking at existing data and not any recommended changes. Um, so that's something that we could start earlier than some of these other things that would require work from the task force. Um, so I just, the rest of it just talks about the timing and then the amount of money is a hundred thousand up to a hundred thousand dollars. And just to make sure people understand why I picked that number is we have an appropriation of $200,000 for our experts. Um, so I basically took half of that amount and put it there. And so if anybody has any concerns or questions about that, um, that's why I highlighted it in the letter, just so people understood why that was there. Uh, one question, since uh, one through five kind of outlines things a little more specifically, is there, would there be a good reason to add six one of, or various other topics that arise? Um, or would this limit us if we just have these five on here? Um, we could add six uh, various other topics that arise. I mean, you know, that's fine. Everybody feel okay with this the way it is then? And Any other questions or concerns? So if, with that change, is it okay if um, the co-chair signed this letter? And, uh, okay. Thank you for doing the work. Oh, no problem. Thank you. All right, so that was the easy document. <laughs> <laughs> so the next document is with respect to retaining a legal expert. Um, to look at potential benefit changes and contribution changes. Um, so most of this is following a template um, that we're required that the state requires is followed with respect to the RFP. Um, and so the dates that you see in there are consistent with state contracting. Um, it will take a while for us to hire a legal expert. As you can see, um, the due date for the RFP is August 20th. Um, but I worked those dates out with legislative council. Um, just to make sure we we're complying with state contracting law. Um, the, the key part is actually on page one, two, three, four, under 2.2, scope of work. And so this is basically advising the task force about any constitutional, legal, contractual issues relative to the state pension and retiree benefits. So, you know, if we were, so the issues they'll be looking at is if we, if we were to change a benefit or a contribution amount, what are our legal, how, how can we legally do that? So for example, do we need to collect the bargaining over a change? Do we not? And so that law is constantly changing about what you have to collect the bargaining over or not, or what you can do unilaterally as a state. And so that, this legal opinion would be very focused on providing us guidance with respect to changes. Um, so that's basically what that scope of work focuses on. And it's very similar it, to what we did in 2009 with respect to the legal expert. Um, it's looking at the legal issues around changing benefits and contribution amounts. And remember that the, the change, any potential changes that would be being looked at would come from this group. So there are, any changes that are anticipated right. to be looked at here. We're just saying that when, if and when we come up with changes, right. they're going to look at it. Right, and so, you know, yeah, this will be looking mm -hmm. at, at what would be needed to do beyond just, you know, we can make recommendations, but, you know, there's a couple of steps that have to occur for those recommendations actually to actually happen. I mean, the legislature would have to take action through passing a bill, um, but there also may be a collective bargaining step that has to be done before changes could actually be implemented. Yes, uh, John, question. Um, and this is really taking a step back from the RFP, uh, like in terms of what's on the page. Do you mentioned previously there's a 
a small group of, of, uh, of uh, experts that work in this area. Um, do we have a sense uh, as, of if, if we know of anyone who's interested in this work? I would just hate for the RFP to go out and for it to close without any bids and us be you know, back to the square one. So just wondering kind of if, there, if we have a sense of, of whether folks are going to be interested. In yes, uh, I mean, we are seeking here a national expert in pension benefits. Um, there, there are actually um, several law firms that specialize on this. Um, the firm that we used in 2009 was Ice Miller. Um, they still do this work. Um, um, I checked with them and I think there's um, several other firms that do this. I mean, what we're looking for is a legal opinion with respect to changing benefits. We're not looking at litigation. I mean, there's tons of firms that do pension litigation, but that is not what we're looking for. We're looking for somebody to analyze basically, you know, what are the legal parameters um, that restrict or limit us or, or don't with respect to changing contribution or pension benefits, or for that matter, retiree health benefits. Yes. Uh, would this uh, firm, would they be present in our meetings every time we meet or would it be uh, work we I, I think, no, I think what they would do is they would provide us with a legal opinion. I think before we accepted the legal opinion, we could probably invite them via Zoom because I doubt they will be a Vermont law firm um, um, to participate in a meeting so that if people have questions about what they wrote, um, that we can get those questions answered. And if there needs to be a redraft, um, that can be done. Okay. But it's in, in looking at the legal opinion that Ice Miller did in 2009, um, there are general parameters about what you can and cannot do. Um, that are governed by case law. And so that will just be a guide of how we can move forward. You know, can the legislature or the state act in doing something without negotiating? Or can it do something, or does it have to negotiate? So regardless of what our recommendations may or may not be, um, we will at least have that guidance about how we move forward after we arrive at recommendations. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Molly. I had one question, um, kind of similar to Andrew's last one with adding number six. I, is it customary that there's only one firm, or I think I think of the medical field, I go for a second opinion. Is there ever an opportunity where we would, or a circumstance where we would want to have multiple firms or have that capacity within this document anyway? Um, it's it's I, I mean, you could have multiple firms. I'm not sure. I mean, you could have multiple actuaries for that point, but it's it's a cost issue, um, and it, it's I'm not sure. I'm not sure you get a very different legal opinion on the, these things. I mean, the, the the law is is somewhat well settled, um, though it changes from you know as as different cases come about. But I, I'm not sure. I mean, we could if that's something the task force wants. I mean, it's just a, it's a cost issue. Mm -hmm. Though I, I will say we have much more wiggle room, I think, with respect to the cost of legal expertise than we do with the actuary. The actuary will be expensive. Um, the legal opinion, I think the last time, Michael, I think you told me it was like $5,000 for the legal, 15,000. So last time it was $15,000. So we would have some room in the amount that's been appropriated to get a second opinion if that's what the task force wanted. Yeah, I'm not necessarily recommending to hire two. I just mean the capacity for yeah. that in the document. Yeah, I think the only other challenge um, would be the timing because as you can see from this, I mean, we're talking about August 20th, the, the, the RFP closes. That still leaves it up to the task force to actually select someone mm -hmm. from the group of law firms that applies for the process. So I think that would be the biggest impediment to getting, impediment to getting a second opinion. But it could be done. We still have a lot of time after that. Just if it makes more better, but I think it, you know, at a law firm, we'd like to have multiple lawyers working on this matter. So we would have multiple, you know, attorneys providing opinion. You know, the areas like John said that are well settled, I think there would be common agreement on those areas that are unsettled for common agreement. And then that gray area, I think they would just describe to us the level of risk, depending on sort of the positions that we take. And I, so I, I think. I think about, you know, I will, whenever we work with legal counsel, you know, they usually set that out well. And, you know, I've never felt that we can't just have people meeting them or not. So just, just one more. Any 
other questions? So is the task force comfortable with moving forward with the RFP? Okay. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, John. Yes, thanks for dropping that. Oh, no problem. And you can see that most of them, most of all of the pages except that one are the standard. Our process yes, with the state. So anybody who ever bids on anything with the state has to go through all yeah. of this. The, the most difficult thing about putting the RFP together was figuring out the dates. Yeah. <laughs> that would okay. work with the task force and work with our contracting laws. All right. So I think we're moving on to our next topic, which is our treasurer, Beth Pierce. Would you like to join us? If it's okay, I'm gonna um, put another chair up here. I don't need a witness, but I have a lot of folders with additional information. You can do day. anything you want. I could have them falling all over the, uh, the floor. So you uh, can do it that. That way. would be Oops. very fine to do. And um, <clears throat> what we're what we um, want to do here is go through the first part of the report that came out in January. And we're not getting into the recommendations yet because we're not at that point. Once we, once we get to the point where we're all throwing out recommendations, but we did not want to get um, caught up into that, um, the weeds of the recommendations and, and forget about um, making sure that we're all on the same page about the, the issues and, the, and where we are. Does that make sense to everybody that so we aren't we aren't going into recommendations yet but we're although this report does but we'll stop kind of on page 29 or wherever that is i'm not sure but <laughs> so thank you madam treasurer and uh, welcome do you know everybody on the yeah it would be helpful yeah, um i as we've talked, I know that there are members of the employee groups, and I'm delighted that they are included this year. The um, the biggest mistake in 2009 was to exclude yeah. them because a lot of the work happened after the right. commission or committee finished its work. But I, I don't know who's with who, well, although I'm, I'm guessing right now that Molly's a teacher um, based on the way she presented materials. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so why don't we go around the room and identify who we are and how we got here, maybe that would be helpful to you. Thank you. Michael Paulson, Deputy Treasurer, we're talking about the Treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that? I think I do. <laughs> okay. Great. Peter Fagan, Representative, House Appropriations, appointed by our state. Molly Stoner, fourth grade teacher, appointed by the Vermont NEA. Beth Munch Pichak, appointed by the legislature. Andrew Emmerich, kindergarten teacher, appointed by Vermont NEA. I'm Eric Davis. I'm an analyst with uh, DEC, and I was appointed by the OCA. I'm Jeanette White. I was appointed by the Pro Tem, or the Committee on Committees. I'm Sarah Copeland Hansis, uh, Chair of Government Operations and appointed to the task force by the Speaker of the House. Um, John Gannon, House Gov Ops, and appointed by the Speaker of the House. And Kate McCann, a high school teacher, appointed by Vermont NEA. I am Leona Watt, and I'm appointed by VSCA, and I'm a probation officer at the Springfield. And Dan Trotter, I was appointed by the Troopers Association. <laughs> Corey Parent, appointed by the Committee on Fitness. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Um, if was... if it would be okay, I'd like to try to address a couple of things that you folks mentioned in your in your. Um, your conversation, I think that uh, just inform on a few pieces that uh, there were some guiding principles and Senator White, you had a great deal to do with that back in 2009, uh, preparing a guiding principles for this. And I I can't tell you how much I, um, I endorse the idea of, uh, of, of looking at those. Uh, they spent um, a fair amount of conversation on those. And I think that that's, that's, a, that's a great idea. Um, I, um, uh, the equal representation and, and having folks involved in here, again, that was a mistake in 2009. And I commend um, the, uh, uh, the General Assembly for, uh, for making that happen. Uh, I think that's been uh, very helpful. 
you know, in terms of creating the agenda, again, that's about um, uh, getting away from that uh, not us, uh, you approach. Everything that's been done over the past and everything that's been done um, in the legislature that uh, has moved the ball is because people collaborate and work together. So I wanna again, commend you folks for, for doing that. Uh, with respect to um, uh, the, um, the policies and, and moving forward on this, I do wanna respond uh, to uh, anticipation of your letter with uh, uh, some uh, discussions with uh, at least the uh, teachers board. Um, and getting back to Molly in terms of uh, the um, defining the problem, uh, my seventh grade teacher, Mr. Horner, uh, talked a lot about uh, how to define scientific method and the first step is define the problem. So I very much appreciate that. I did want to point out, and it's it's clearly, this is your commission, not, uh, uh, not me, um, uh, task force, not me, but um, Back in a, a little background, Ice Miller was selected, and what they did is kind of do a general parameter and then responded. Um, a um, individual that was, I, I know that the VSEA employed, or I think that it might have been a, a um, along with the Vermont NEA, presented um, a um, uh, their perspective at the time. Um, that individual was uh, Beth Robinson, so I think people know her fairly well. Um, but um, I think that you might want to, Give that a copy of that to to your um, to to whoever you select, uh, because I think that having that information and obviously I'm not a lawyer, but I do know that the landscape is is um, changing as well. But I think that would be helpful for them in terms of response. If you do not have that, we can provide that for you. Uh, and uh, again, I just want to say thank you for all the good work. Uh, and. In my experience and Michael's experiences with contracts is uh, that that one page is great, it's important, and that's the crux of what you're trying to do, but everybody gets caught up with the uh, contract terms with the state, you know, whether it's indemnification, liability issues. So uh, planning having a, at least a few discussions on that with uh, whoever, especially if you're gonna be dealing with uh, attorneys. Uh, so no, no disrespect to attorneys, um, but um, I think that um, uh, that's been our experience in working with folks. Um, uh, what we think is straightforward um, in those terms of those boilerplate uh, contract provisions, uh, but you can always appeal to the attorney general's office to, um, to give you a little room on those. Um, so uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I did do a uh, presentation that takes the materials out of the report as well as some other materials. And one of the things I remembered to do this time was put page numbers on it uh, because that's a, and that was a, an addition about two o'clock last yesterday morning, but, uh, but we, uh, we, we do have that. So, uh, and I do know that uh, some folks like it electronically. Um, I planned on that. And by the way, I did make copies of other documents and I made 12 copies, um, uh, not 13. So Michael, you're, um, uh, you're gonna have to wait to get back to the office, but uh, hey. Um, so uh, the agenda that I was hoping to go through, and again, this is your, your task force, was to cut, go through the pension funding status, the methods, how we get there, how does this all work? and. Uh, uh, and then go through gains and losses. Uh, what, you know, what are the drivers and the increase in the unfunded liability? Um, a little bit about how an experience study works and what we gained from that or looked at. I'm not gonna, I just have some attachments that, uh, that really come from VPIC uh, of which I'm a member, but, uh, uh, and, and I don't plan on doing a lot on investments, but it's there for your, um, uh, for your um, uh, review. And then pre-funding OPEB, uh, that is a hot topic with us. Uh, we've been uh, trying to uh, work on that for some time and then some summary. And uh, I was remiss in pointing out too that it's great to be here and see you all in per person, including Chris, um, Luke from um, JFO, because we've talked many times, but today was the first time we had an opportunity to meet. So I think that's important. Um, if you go to page two, uh, three, excuse me, the, um, you see the purpose, and I'm gonna try to go through some of these quickly, the purpose of evaluation. You know, it really is about assessing the adequacy of the system to pay current and future retirement benefits. It's all about retirement security. You want a system that will be able to pay people this generation, the next generation, the generation after that, and, and ongoing. It's also about intergenerational equity. If you don't resolve problems, the next generation is going to pay for it. Um, Social Security comes to mind, you know, and, and, and the scares that we have um, at what will happen if... Uh, if um, Congress um, and, and the president don't act. Uh, outputs, you know, you, you calculate the, act the accrued liabilities, the actuarially accrued 
uh, liabilities. You calculate the value of assets, it differs from the market value, and there's a reason for that, and I'll mention that in a little bit. The funding status, you know, what percent is funded? Uh, that's an important piece. What is the ADEC? That, now, folks that have been here a, a long time, uh, um, no disrespect, uh, uh, Representative Fagan, when we used to talk, we'd say, pay the arc, pay the arc, and it was a really good good line. Uh, you remember that as well, Senator. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm used to that, that respect level there. Um, but um, it's now called the Actuarially Determined Employer Contribution, um, just so we go through acronyms. GASB, the Government Accounting Standards Board, created that new term. Pay the ADAC doesn't have the same it ring. It doesn't have the <laughs> ring, no. exactly. I, you know, I've, we got into pay the arc, pay the arc, yeah. and we were successful with that. Yeah. And, I'm, and, and so far, and I want to say thank you, we've been successful with uh, paying the ADAC, even if it doesn't have that same ring to it. Um, identify some of the um, uh, the losses and, and gains, and review the, the within the context of, of the authority the amortization period. Get into some of your your concerns about that. So those are the types of things that evaluation uh, will do. They're taking a look at the long term sustainability of the fund. They're giving you the measures on where you are, and uh, and they take a look at the funding policy. And that's a more narrow approach from a from an actuary. They're not going to tell you how to do things. They're not going to say you should do this benefit and so on. They're, they're calculated for you, but they're really looking at the adequacy of how much is funded and how you fund that um, and how you amortize that over a period of time, which is actually in the purview of the, uh, the General mm -hmm. Assembly. Uh, we are in a closed system, and I wanted to get that across to folks. There are two ways to do valuations. The first one um, is an open, and you really don't do that because it, it creates all sorts of um, uh, nuances and problems with it. And an open, although we did that, um, 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 Representative um, Copeland Hansis and, uh, and Representative Gannon, when we were in that risk assessment back in 2019, which really is a precursor to where we are now, they did an open valuation to say, what's happening now and what's it gonna look like with some of the trends? When you do a, an uh, valuation, you're looking at a closed valuation. What does it look like? as of June 30th. So it's essentially a, a snapshot at that period of time. Uh, and then, it's, and as I said, it's done annually. Uh, I've struggled with how to present, you know, what, what, how this all works. And uh, so I've done a little bit of reading. I've cobbled together here. So I wanna give credit where credit is due. The Siegel Group, some of their, um, their valuations and their, um, and their uh, reports in other states, tutorials, um, as well as GRS, which stands for uh, uh, Gabriel Roder Smith, another actuarial firm, and that piece in the middle really comes from them. And I thought that was pretty pretty helpful. Um, and I put an example here: hired at age thirty, somebody comes in. Uh, I'm sixty seven, so if I were to start, you know, I'd have a different scenario in terms of probability of retirement than someone who's age thirty or somebody that comes in. Uh, we see a lot of. Um, uh, teachers that come in mid-career, for instance. So they're gonna be different decisions and probability. So what's the probability they're gonna reach retirement? Are they gonna leave before that? And actuaries estimate that based on uh, characteristics of the census, the, uh, whether it's age, whether it's um, uh, turnover that we've seen historically, um, uh, uh, consolidation, uh, Act 46 had an impact on that. We tried to give them information about what happened in there and folks that were in different schools and provided, uh, provided that. So when will the member retire? Um, you know, at age 30, you have different options. Um, and uh, so you, um, I'm already past the normal retirement date, but I plan to stay here for some time. So just for the record, but uh, you know, and, and so you're gonna retire with an annual benefit. What does that look like? Are you gonna retire early retirement? Are you gonna do normal? And how much is that benefit going to be? And that's based on, again, these are all based on assumptions, what the salary increases will look like. So they're looking and saying, you make X now, and when you, you know, get to retirement, uh, you're, you're likely based on wage scales, something that's called productivity, which is looking at um, uh, gross domestic product and what's happening in, um, in, in different areas that impact uh, the, um, uh, the productivity of the workforce. Uh, they're gonna take a look at cost of living uh, patterns that the state has, and they're gonna put some assumptions about what that benefit would be. And there's obviously inflation to that. I always use the example, I'm, I'm an older person. Um, uh, when I got out of college in 1976, I had a job that was uh, $13,000. And people said, wow, how did you get that? You know, it was pretty good. Um, and uh, I don't think I'd be working for $13,000 now. And unfortunately, by the way, some people do. And that is a travesty in terms of income and, uh, and uh, 
uh, what happens in terms of uh, uh, people in this state. And then how long are you going to live uh, in retirement? That has changed over time. Uh, and uh, what we do find is people are living longer, not as long as some of the mortality tables that the Society of Actuaries came out with. And that was one of my discussions with actuaries at the time. A new table came out in 2014, and then they've had updates every year since. And those updates said, yeah, they're gonna live longer, but not quite as much as the first one. So we've tried to grapple with that as we're looking at the impact it has on the, um, on the, act, uh, on the actuarial results. You take all that information, they do this for every single person. And they create a range of probabilities because that 30 year old or myself or that 40 year old, um, they're, they're gonna be different options that they have. So they create a range of probabilities. So uh, for instance, I would be in there split over a different period of time for different probabilities of what death is going to do. Um, uh, possibly more at, um, um, at certain, uh, certain uh, assumptions. They aggregate that up for every single person in the workforce. Um, and then what they do um, is they put that in a, what's called a uh, projected value of future benefits, the normal cost, the, uh, the actually um, uh, the liability that those individuals will have. And then they look at assets. And uh, so what assets are available? And those come from investment earnings. They come from employee contributions. They come from employer contributions. And I will say that employees have stepped up to the plate since 2010 and are contributing more and have, have really worked hard on this. Um, uh, as we're looking at some painful decisions, we need to recognize that they've been there as part of the conversation. And then you produce these results, which I had on the uh, previous page, some of the results. Um, Page five, and I'll, I'll try to move a little faster as we move on, but uh, uh, page five is just what that looks like in terms of accrued, um, uh, actuarially accrued liability. What is it going to cost for those present and future benefits? Um, and then what is the normal cost? And a normal cost means that if I hi was hired today, you would not have any past service costs for me, um, that part of the liability. Um, you, um, and what it would cost each you know, increment each year divided up, what are you gonna to need to put aside so when Beth hits that retirement or when that 30 year old hits that retirement or when Eric hits that retirement, what is the amount of money you're gonna to need to put aside each year to, to, to make that happen? And then what, uh, what those future normal costs will look like. This is all done on a present value basis, uh, taking a look and saying, what are the dollars you need in today's dollars to make that work? And uh, so um, just wanted to explain that as we move forward. Um, any questions on any of that? I like the GRS piece because it put it into a human context on how does this all work in terms of decision making? And it's a lot of work. Um, page six, uh, just the key points, and I'll try to go a little quicker through the different sections. Um, but uh, so I try to put some key summary points at the front. And uh, the funding status is deteriorating, uh, the unfunded liability is growing in both plans. Uh, the cost of the ADEC um, is, is also growing. Um, in the teacher system that is funded um, um, by um, uh, mo the general fund for the most part, there's a now a piece that comes from uh, uh, locals. We put that in place. Uh, I'm trying to remember about 2014, 2015, where they would, if they're on federal grants, um, that they would um, reimburse the, the, um, the state for those um, dollars that are being reimbursed by the feds and transfer those to us. Um, the general fund uh, pays for most of the state uh, piece. Uh, there's a, um, uh, the, v, uh, the, the state system visas. It's about 36 to 40% of it, 30, and then the other cost centers. So whether you work in transportation, whether you work in human services and you're funded by federal dollars, for instance, and I did not bring the figure, but if memory serves me correctly, someplace about 23% of the dollars that um, are required for, um, uh, to, to pay for pensions is reimbursed through federal government, uh, whether it's in uh, human services or transportation. Um, I'll confirm that number, um, but that is, it's something in that range. Um, again, there's historical growth in the liabilities. And in our report, uh, we identified that the, the increase from 2021 to 2000, and, um, or excuse me, the 19 value to the 2020, the 19 valuation 
sets the, uh, or the 20 sets the unfunded liability, and it also gives you the recommendation for the ADEC. It's just timing in terms of when this is done and how that impacts the appropriation process. So an increase of 604 million and an increase of uh, just under 97 million. I have a question. Sure. So Beth, um, one of the, the first question I asked um, when we started this is have we identified uh, all of the problems that are causing the deterioration in the, in the value of the assets and in the, in the capability of the assets actually. Yeah. The that's, a, that's a very so, good question. And, and I know that, that you know, we've done an experience rating. We have done what we mm -hmm. normally need to do. Um, and I'm asking a question that may not be answerable 100%, but I'm asking your best estimate. Have we identified all of the problems that are inherent in this fund so that we can then address them. So uh, we're gonna get into a little bit more of that on actual gains and losses, but uh, to answer your question, which is a great question, you're not gonna be able to anticipate everything. These are estimates, actuaries pre prepare estimates. The rate of inflation, for instance, has been going down, 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 down. Um, and uh, uh, the CPIU Northeast is what we use in calculating benefits. Uh, this year, and you see that in my presentation, it's up over 4%. Uh, so security uses a different um, um, CPI index, and they're talking someplace north of five. Um, that's some of it is related to uh, COVID um, and pent up demand. Um, I, I'm not an economist. I frequently say that I think that this is a longer term piece. That's uh, uh, my non-professional uh, opinion of this. Uh, and eventually I'll be right. I don't know what year, but um, it's sort of like the, uh, you know, the stop clock there. But um, they can't predict that um, in economic events. No one could uh, pre um, predict the Great Recession or COVID. Um, the, um, uh, when I, one of the charts in here that you see on investments is uh, the, um, the uh, Asian markets that impacted this Brexit. Um, certainly none of us voted for Brexit. Uh, I don't, you know, and uh, to this day, I'm not sure how that all, I, again, I tried to predict before that. And uh, I said, it's never gonna happen. Um, I'm not very good at those predictions. The last time, um, I know this is a serious issue, but I'm gonna say it anyways. The last time I got an election right was McGovern Nixon and I didn't vote that way. But um, um, those are events that you can't anticipate. But there are things under our control, the national events, inflation, national policy, those are not things that we can control, but local state issues we can. And one of, and you see this later in the presentation, one of the issues that has eluded us, we've brought this up in just about every report that we've sent over to the General Assembly over the, uh, the past several years is workforce issues, particularly in the teacher system. If you take a look at the turnover, in employees, if you take a look at the um, uh, the um, retirement experience, it's about 37%. And again, I'm doing this from memory. There's a there's a number in here. We'll see how close I got um, um, of the of the changes in um, liabilities, the increase in liabilities. The way I've described this to the past in testimony over the over the years is, you know, you have property tax pressures, you have different pressures, you have new policies around schools and reorganization. As you press the balloon at that end, it pops out at the other end in terms of retirement and its impacts there. And the trick of this is to take a look at the whole cost. We look at it in silos. We look at the impact it has in terms of property tax and property tax relief or whatever it might be. And then we don't look at it and make the link up to what the, the, the impact is on, on the pension system. And my belief is that there needs to be a holistic look at that. Uh, it's something that we've uh, testified to that effect over the years. It's a tough one to get your arms around, but that was a big issue, um, um, Representative Fagan. Uh, the other is uh, the decisions we made while well, we stopped um, uh, the process of not funding the pensions and started pay the arc, pay the arc. Um, we continued on to 2015 to pay for the health benefits in the teachers fund out of the uh, pension system. And that added um, um, over a hundred million dollars to the unfunded liability. So there are things in our control. We should identify those and look. Now, I'm not gonna get into the, the uh, property tax debate. That's not my job. And I'm not a workforce expert, okay? But the reality is that you need to take a look at it and define, getting back to, to Molly's point again, define the problem and then look at what are your decision and policy decisions that you may want to uh, address there. 
Um, I'm going to talk about this more and you're going to say, you just said a whole bunch, so how much more are you going to do? But we'll go there. Oh, no, no, no. It's a great question and it's great context as you're looking at this. Um, page seven is the funding status and it's really made up of a couple of things. And I, um, one is the, um, the status of the pension liabilities. Um, um, do you have assets available to meet those? And that's the bottom line. Again, retirement security is what this is all about. We want individuals when they get to retirement to have enough income um, and to have a fund that's there and not a fund that's deteriorated uh, to the point that there is no security. Um, you know, I read a report recently about the increase in elderly um, bankruptcy and poverty. And uh, I think that you folks should talk to AARP about some of that. And uh, uh, that's a travesty uh, again, and it hits Vermont even more because we have an older population. And uh, I think that we need to take a look and say, what are we looking at in terms of security for those individuals down the road? Um, are we contributing? Is the employer and the employee contributing um, the plan at the recommended rate? You know, are we funding the ADEC? We are now. Um, we didn't in the past. Um, and again, as recently as 2015 in the teachers, there was some underfunding. And is there a plan in place to deal with the um, unfunded liability, that amortization, that date? And is it doable? Um, you know, one of the things the actuary says, well, you have a plan in place to retire this. And the question is, and, and uh, Chris and I agreed on this number, is that uh, you're going to need to have about 500 million, half billion dollars in the, in the late 2030s, 2036, that, that seven, eight, to pay for this. Is that doable? Now, if you put that in present value, it's not that much of an increase. But on the other hand, the state budget is not increasing at that same level. So is it doable? And is it going to be a point, a tipping point where you say, we can't do this? And we want to avoid that tipping point. Can I have a question? Sure. Um, and I don't know if the answer is right now or not, but number one, it, how, how are the percentages, you know, uh, if I contribute, Dan Trotter is going to contribute X percent. Um, how is that? How was that? Or how is that number determined? That's a matter of policy. Um, and, um, and frankly, uh, the legislature sets the benefits. Uh, including with the uh, contribution levels. Now, the boards do provide recommendations. Sometimes they're, 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 they're um, taken, sometimes they're not. You know, um, Senator White, we've talked a lot about, um, uh, we're actually involved in a task force right now, uh, or were, on who belongs in Group C, who doesn't belong in Group C. Uh, ultimately, the, the, the General Assembly is going to make those decisions. Um, so the, the General Assembly is the owner in the creator of the solution. We're gonna provide information, but it is the, the General Assembly that's ultimately gonna make the decisions, um, presumably with um, the governor and you know that we don't get to a point if we have collaboration where there would be potentially a veto. You set the benefits, uh, excuse me, I'll look at you two. You set the benefits, you set the funding policy and you appropriate the dollars. Um, we provide background. Uh, we act as a, um, as a conduit for the boards. Boards meet generally monthly, a little bit more than that. So we provide support to the boards and the attorney general provides legal support to the boards, the board of trustees who are fiduciaries to the fund. Does that answer your question or did I just- Yeah, no, I'm just, okay. uh, again, I, I know one of my questions is coming in. Uh, and I apologize, I, I, I have, uh, my kids gave me a sticker on my fridge. It says, I can't math. So like, that's where I'm coming from. So the numbers, uh, so I just want to get my, I, like, when they say, hey, you should contribute, you know, Dan Trotter should contribute this percentage, Andrew should contribute this percentage. Yep. Where does that number come from? Yep. Uh, and, and that was one of the things yeah. that I have. I had one other question, and I don't sure. know if it's possible to get that, but is, is it safe to assume that if, if uh, and I don't know how often the actuaries, we have the actuaries doing their thing, but um, if, if they said, in, and I'm just going to use 2019, it was this, and now in 2021, it's going to be this. Uh, is it safe to assume that they made changes to their calculations? And if so, are we able to understand what yes. changes they made so we can understand, okay, why did this number go from here to there? Again, a good question. Um, and there are two ways that that happens. One, again, if you go back to that first page with age 30, there are assumptions. How long is it gonna take for, um, uh, uh, what, what's the probability of a retirement? How, what's the benefit? Those are assumptions that are built into the valuation. They aggregate that up for every single employee. Um, 
those are in the valuation report are done annually. And there's a chart in there that says, these were the assumptions, and this is how much you varied from those assumptions. And we'll have an exhibit in a little while that shows you that. In addition to that, if the assumption is off, you true it up and you true it up through an experience study, which we do every five years. That's a statutory level. That's what happens as a general practice across the country. But I think we agreed and we recommended, and frankly, the, the General Assembly has changed that to every three years. So I think that that's a good move. Um, but you wanna true up your assumptions. Does it make sense? Now, again, things can change from there. Inflation being a great example. And I think inflation is the biggest risk um, because it impacts so many different pieces of um, the assumptions, whether it's investments, whether it's COLA, whether it's salary gro uh, growth. And as that changes, it has an impact. So having more frequent helps, but that's what you do, you true up and you and hopefully make the appropriate changes. Well, the assumptions change, but uh, to the extent that they are supported by any um, actions by the General Assembly that those happen in, in, uh, in um, um, uh, the same process. Um, Eric has a follow up sure. and then I have one as well. Yes, uh, thank, thank you. Um, Kath, I have a question on uh, the plan to retire the unfunded liability and how it relates to the funding status. Sure. Uh, especially considering our charge includes looking at the amortization schedule. Um, now, pay, the legislature has been paying the ADAC for uh, since 2008, um, but the ADAC is predicated on each subsequent payment increasing by 5% in the beginning, 3% in the end. When that was agreed to, you know, I think people said it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Correct. It's a turning point until the payments graduate to a point um, when you're actually paying down the unfunded liability. Paying the ADAC and paying down the unfunded liability are not necessarily the same thing. Um, so there, do we have a sense of what sort of deterioration in the funding status was planned versus unplanned? Because there are certainly other pressures that have um, brought down the funding status uh, you know, that we did not foresee when we agree to the amortization schedule. Sure. Just something to keep in mind as we think about the amortization schedule. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, is, I interrupted you, so if there's more yeah. to, the, uh, to the comment or the question, I, the, I apologize. The question of how much uh, deterioration was planned, how much did we expect versus uh, how much was on the So I look at an amortization schedule as a mortgage payment, the analogy. Uh, now at the end, you own the house. Um, hopefully here you own retirement security. But uh, it's, so it's a period over time and, and depending how you set up the mortgage, if you do it in 15 years, if you do it in 30 years, if it's backloaded interest only at the front, you get different levels of interest that you pay. And at the beginning of a mortgage, you're not seeing the principal in most cases of the, of the, um, of the, the loan essentially um, uh, going down because you're paying interest. And if you look at the amortization tables that are in the actuarial reports, uh, they will show you the same thing that over time you're paying off interest at the same time there's growth in terms of um, of the liability because you're paying interest first and you have an opportunity loss on that because um, in terms of paying down the unfunded liability now as assumptions have changed and as realized gains and losses have changed um, that schedule changes uh, back in 2000 and 12, I think our estimate was that it would get worse, just as you said, but by about 2021, things would start to get better. Things didn't work out that way, okay? Um, and the actuary, as we change, uh, change assumptions and as we change uh, as real behavior um, and real gains and losses interact with it, you're gonna see a change in that. It is backloaded. And that was something we changed, I believe in 2016 with the General Assembly. Uh, our office pointed out that the interest you're paying is pretty high because it's backloaded. Every year it increased in 5% increment. So you're looking at this, you figure out how much you have to pay with the interest and it's backloaded. Uh, we asked you folks to make it 3%, uh, which is a little closer to inflation. Um, so that seemed a little more reasonable. Um, you acted on that and that saved both systems $165 million of interest. And that saved the taxpayers $165 million of uh, uh, interest. So looking at that, how much is a balancing act? Because when you change that, that meant you were paying more up front, just as, as I said, when you change a, a mortgage. But I think it's something that you do want to look at. I would caution that you do not want to just kick the can down the road. 
because that costs the taxpayers in the form of interest. But there are ways to take a look at it. Um, the actuaries in our risk assessment report, which again, um, uh, Representative Gannon, we, you were part of that process uh, as, as were you, Sarah. I'm sorry, I just did that. Okay, I can't get Copeland hands us out at, at the same time, so I get tongue tied. <laughs> so, hey, what can I say? But um, um, I think that uh, there are ways to take a look at that, but just using that and saying, eh, that just puts the problem out the road. Government Finance Office Association did a best practice. And what that means is you're all you're kicking it down, you're costing more, and you're not solving the problem. Um, the rating agencies do something what they call above water, below water. And if you keep doing that, uh, you're essentially below water and you're going to stay there. Quick follow up on that. Um, I agree completely with that, um, that we've done a lot of work building up the capacity and we don't really want to see that. Um, is are, if there are projections from 2008 when the uh, uh, previous amortization schedule was 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 formulated, um, if, if if those could be shared with the community, absolutely. The task force, that would be, that'd be wonderful. You know, if I will try, um, I try to do some of this because we 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 want to make sure that we don't. Um, you know, um, blow through our, our actuarial budget very quickly, but we can pull out the tables. I can put something together that looks at some of the assumptions that push that. And then I will run it by our actuaries because, um, you know, uh, I'm not an actuary. I can do some of the front work and then let them take a look and say, no, you got to change this. You got to do this. Um, but we will try to get you something to, to get to that effect. And, you know, I've, um, I've said that Eric, and this is a compliment that you're a bit of a uh, um, actuary wannabe and I consider that a compliment. So it's a very good question. Thank so, you. I'll, I'll take it as a compliment. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, if you take a look, I think Sarah had a, yeah, yeah, I'm I, sorry, I a, Sarah. sorry. On. Representative, um, there you go. Quite all right, you call me Sarah. Um, I had a follow on to the question that Dan was asking before, um, but just wanted to also put out there that while the legislature has uh, determined the, the benefits and the contribution levels, uh, the other part of the equation, uh, which is the uh, demographic assumptions and the investment returns are, are completely out of the right. control of the legislature um, with good reason. Um, yes. But but still, you know, a significant impact on the, uh, right. the position that we're in right now. But I wanted to come back to the question about, uh, about what those employee contributions are based on, because um, it has occurred to me that, uh, that even if you can assess how much of the current unfunded liability is due to underfunding of the past, um, and you can hope for better uh, demographics and investment mm -hmm. returns in the future, there is still a part of that unfunded liability that uh, that seems to be due to a system that's that was that has been changed incrementally based on um, you know the historic uh, employee contribution levels that that might have been based on assumptions that are no longer valid in terms of longevity, in terms of um, you know how how people move in and out of the workforce. Um, and so I guess I would just ask, do we have the ability to, uh, to ask ourselves as a task force, what, how would we build this retirement system if we were starting over from scratch and we wanted to make sure that today's you know 28 year old is going to be able to live in retirement with a predictable benefit until they're 95? Mm -hmm. So um, we do have historical information on what the um, what the contributions are, and what share of the uh, that is versus the ADEC, the uh, or the ARC in the past, and we can provide that to you. Um, generally speaking, roughly sixty two percent of what's paid in the um, in the uh, to retirement is through uh, investment income and. Depending on the year, I mean, when you don't contribute, like in the teacher system back in, uh, in 1997, for instance, um, uh, the employee paid more of the share uh, than, the, uh, than, the, uh, than the state. So those contributions are roughly half, a little, a little more geared, I believe, to the uh, teacher system. That is in the uh, 2009 report, um, a piece of that. Um, and that one is a long time ago, and I'm going to have to defer and, uh, and take a look. And we have changed some of the rates, but we can get that for you. One of the concepts that you're talking about is risk sharing. And I think that that feeds into, you know, the decision-making around that and whether those are actuary, ultimately everything is actuarially neutral because of, 
the, the employee and the employer do not pick up that in contributions. Um, it gets picked up uh, or investments. It gets, you get adjustments to the ADAC every year. So ultimately it's actually neutral um, in terms of con com combination, but what share people have and how much they contribute is something that varies from state to state. And uh, it's a, some of it is public policy decisions, um, whether you want to, uh, if you have recruitment issues in one uh, group, for instance, or, uh, uh, but we can get you that information, but it really is a, a lot of that's public policy as well. How much do you believe as a, as a, as a legislator that, um, that this person should be paying versus another group uh, in the system? And uh, in the municipal system, there are separate, it's, it's a menu. You can be in group A, B, C, or D. Uh, D is actually law enforcement. And in each group, there's a different level of um, employer and employee costs. Uh, and those are sh only the municipality or the, or the school system because over 50% of the municipal system is actually non-teacher, uh, non-certified teachers. Um, uh, they, they pay a separate amount. To, if they pay for it, they should get, you know, they, they get the benefit associated with it. So it's a little bit different. In the state system, we call that a, a, um, a single employer entity. Uh, so that's all, you know, when you get down to it, it's all together. We don't report separately on that. It's a single employer, um, but we can break that out for you. Did that answer the question or am I going around it? Or Well, I'm, what I'm trying to understand is if we were starting from scratch right mm -hmm. now, would our um, employer employee contribution rates be what they are now? Or are those vestiges of a system that was designed 30, 40 years ago that has been incrementally changed over time? So uh, I wasn't around in 1947 or something when either the teacher or the state plan uh, was, uh, was uh, developed. But my presumption is there was a decision about what share people were supposed to do how much would be investments, how much would be employer and employee. And it was probably based on, you're gonna take this share of the normal cost, for instance, or whatever it might be. I, we can certainly take a look at what the percentages were, but ultimately that was a public policy decision. You have to fund the whole thing, but who pays what is up to the General Assembly. Has that changed over time? Um, and is it, the, is, is it, does it look like what we did in 1970 or 1985 or whatever it might be? Um, we can provide some of that information. I've done some of that for the teacher system. I dusted off the old actuary reports back to 1982, did some analyses, and I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, I said someone else is going to have to do it for the other two systems because that, uh, that took up an awful lot of my time. Um, and we will delegate that to somebody at some point in time. Like we can talk about that. But... Uh, <clears throat> but um, um, we can provide that information so, for you. Some people did jigsaw puzzles to pass the time during the pandemic. I take it you were reviewing actuarial reports. <laughs> a little back bit. To the 80s. A little bit, but I did find new hobbies too. Yes. So, you know, it, uh, I now have decorative flower vases all over the house, which if you look at me, you say, that's not Beth. Um, but, <laughs> um, but, you know, at some point in time when you're in the house for a very long period of time, you, you pick up new, uh, new things to do. But yes, I spent a lot of time on, uh, on these issues because so, they're important. So... When I'm thinking of it, about your question, kind of, I think about it as um, making change, incremental changes. And we, we, we built a house a long time ago and a lot of fr our friends built houses and we called them hippie built houses because you built this little part and then you built a shed off here and then you built another one off here and then you built something off here. And so, if your original house that you started with had faults, the whole thing had faults. And, and so your question is, was, are we building onto something that might have been okay to start with, but isn't okay now, or might not even have been okay to start with? Okay. Absolutely. That's okay. And that's a public policy. You know, yeah. During testimony at one point, um, and I won't get into what group or, and someone said, how did that happen? And I wanted to say, uh, you voted for it. Yeah. Um, but um, the reality is that you also voted on it based on information you received and those discussions. And has the, has the landscape changed since then? The landscape has changed. And we know that. And we need to, to go back and assess yeah, that. Yeah. And, and I guess my, my point in bringing this up is really that um, 
I want to make sure that we have fully illuminated this part of the challenge so that when we do make those recommendation decisions here as a task force that may ultimately lead to policy decisions adopted at the legislature that we're making those decisions with our eyes wide open and a full understanding um, because you know many of us were surprised to find that the 2009 recommendations didn't get us where we thought we needed to be sort of on a more sustainable track in the long term. Now, some of that may be because the 2009 recommendations were, um, were largely set mm -hmm. aside and ignored as opposed to adopted by the legislature. But my hope is that among this task force that we can that we can have a full and honest assessment and turn over every rock and understand um, how we how we got here as well as whether the foundation of the central you know uh, you know structure of our pensions is is or was ever sustainable mm -hmm. so I guess what I would say to that is I think that more recommendations were done uh, than uh, than uh, uh, that have been characterized in this uh, I don't have the report in front of me. If someone has it, the 2009 report, and I'm doing this from memory, someone can test okay. me. Uh, there you go. Take a look at page six. And if you, if you want to hand that over to me, I think I can answer that. Um. Yeah, let's make sure we don't go too far down. This yeah, I don't, I don't want to go. I, I, I don't want to keep you from your because yeah. plan. Presentation. Sure, thank you. Um, I believe that, um, and I guess I do have the wrong page, but we'll work that out. I believe that the recommendations were at a much different scale. The teachers' um, um, ADEC at that point in time was someplace in the $60 million, and we were trying to get it down into the 40s. Um, I believe the recommendations that the actuary put together was someplace around $29, $30 million. I was hoping to find that. I thought it was page six, but um, I know it's at the front end. We did 20 million out of that 29, 30 million of recommendations. Now, um, they came after the fact, you know, through that different discussion. The scale was different, but there was a percentage that was, was acted on. Since 2009 and 10, the, the, the real increase in the workforce issues and the teacher system exploded in 2011. So I think that that's some of the, the piece, but the scale of this thing back in 10 I think they pretty much did their job. Uh, the problem is getting to your point, um, assumptions and, and real life changed since then. The investments have changed, uh, you know, the, the rate of inflation again, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the workforce issues. And I keep talking about the teacher issues, but they're there in the other, um, in, in visas as well. Salary expectations, um, the teachers were like this. The salary expectations that are in the, um, in the uh, uh, the valuations up to now, the, the pre up to 2020, teacher salaries haven't kept pace with that. On the other hand, in the state system, don't get mad at me, um, they, they, they've exceeded that. So you have to look at the assumptions. I would also point out that there's a fundamental issue here, which is assumptions are a guidepost. They're to help you develop your plan. In reality, it's real experience that counts. Um, and at the end of this thing, when you get to 2038 or whatever year we might end this thing, it's going to be based on when people retired, what were the investments, what was the rate of inflation, what was the cost of living, not what we estimated, um, and I see some actuaries call it a guess, but what we estimated back, um, you know, in 2009 and in 2010 and 11. Uh, th thank you for your time today. Uh, I have a, just one question. I'm trying to remember. I think it was in one of the services presentation that um, the funding status actually was on an uptick, um, maybe 2018, <laughs> 2019, and then um, the assumed rate of return was one from seven and a half to seven percent, which mm -hmm. I think then started to lower it down. But thinking back to Eric's point about having it get worse before it gets better, you know, we're roughly then 11 years into it things started to appear that maybe they were getting better there um, before changing that assumed return. Um, so maybe the system and the recommendations from 2009 actually were working um, and were getting us on the right track for that change. They were right at the time. Um, they, again, events changed. Uh, economic events changed, economic cycles changed. Uh, as I said, Brexit, different, um, different, different economic events, as well as workforce. 
that gets me back to the presentation. So thank you, Andrew. Um, and if you take a look at page nine, uh, this is the state system. And we provide this in our annual report every year and in, in the various reports we do to committee. Um, if you go to 2007 in the state system, so right in the, um, this is the, the unfunded liability and where it is, you see that the state system was in surplus. Uh, that a negative 11 million in the funded status means that they were over um, by $11 million. That was 100.8%, not 108, 100.8, very fragile, but it was there. And then the Great Recession hit, and you see those numbers grow fairly substantially. So before uh, 2007, uh, you see some growth in the state system. Um, and again, at, you learn surplus. 2008, most of the Great Recession hit in the latter part of that year, you know, the um, uh, September of 08, which is part of the fiscal year 2009. So you see the, these downward trends. We expected it to get better, and for, you know, for, you know, from seven, you know, a little bit. But what you see is the continued degrading of the of the numbers. Um, and some of that we said, we got to take a look under the hood and find out what's what's going on. That's part of what you're doing today. But the numbers have not improved. In fact, they've gotten worse and uh, taking a good look under the hood on what those issues are. And we've got a piece on that a little further down. If you go to the next page, the teachers and uh, uh, well, let me just, uh, so what I did on page 10 was just show the liabilities growing, what the unfunded liability uh, looked like and, and how that, um, that incre increased over time. You see in 2010, when we did a few fixes, it went down a little bit, um, but it didn't hold. Um, the next page, page 11, is in our report, and this is the scope of where we are now. Uh, we're talking in the state system about a $225 million increase from 2020 uh, or 19 Val to the 2020 uh, Val, which again affects the 2020 budget. So uh, we were looking based on a mandate from the retirement boards to provide a recommendation to you on how to bring that down to the 2019 levels. And if you recall, um, Representative Gannon, in our 2019 risk study, we were looking to lower it past, lower it even further. We were trying to, to lower it from the 2019 Val. Um, that's behind us at this point in time. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're concentrating right now on trying to get to this. And the change in the ADEC was $36 million. You go to the next page, we have the similar uh, pages for the state system, a uh, teacher system. And you see that um, uh, a similar pattern that uh, 2008 uh, 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 and beginning there was a, a tough time, you know, getting into the 60s. Now, I want to caution, and you see that little arrow on that and reflects a different actuarial method. This was a little mind boggling to me. I was a deputy treasurer at the time, and we won't get into who said what, but, um, you know, they, they put in a very small amount into the, um, into the, um, um, uh, into the ADEC uh, versus what the, uh, the uh, actuary said. And I, I looked at Jeb Spalding, the treasurer, and said, boy, what did they see next year's number? It's going to look horrible. And then it didn't change. So I'm saying, why? Okay. And started to dig, uh, and then called, called our actuary. Um, and uh, what happened was the state had a, in statute, and I don't know, I think it was in the 80s that someone came up with this idea, and it was called frozen initial liability. I know I'm getting into the weeds, but give me a moment. They had an outlier actuarial method. And what happened is it froze the liability. So no matter what you do, the liability was gonna stay roughly where it was. And then everything went into the normal cost. So you still had that increase in the ARC, now the ADEC, but it was masking the real um, uh, unfunded liability. So when folks say we were almost there, we weren't. And uh, a couple of pages in, because I was trying to stay with the, 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 the graph process. So if you go to page 13, you see the same graph that you saw in the teacher's system and you see the same goal, which is at $379 million increase in the uh, unfunded liability in the 60 million. That both of those total up to the $604 million uh, increase in unfunded liabilities in the 97 million bo bogey. But if you go to, I just explained page 15, so I won't do it again. Uh, that's how, that, that odd methodology. If you go to page 16, and these were in the 2005 report to the legislature, if you take a look at it, and you can't go back, those were, those were what it was. If you take a look, and I'm going to go back to 15 because I'm having trouble reading those small graphs. Um, but uh, the, um, 
the, um, it distorted it and the cost associated with it. So under the new method, the method that's correct, um, the method that's a standard for funding purposes and is a standard by GASB for accounting purposes, the unfunded liability in 2001 was not 93.8 million. If you use the, the, the current method, it was 315 million. Um, and if you take a look at the funded position, you see that um, um, that uh, that 92.3 percent is actually based on the same consistent methodology, 81.1. Now, the reason that's important, if you look at that graph in the upper left, you see that the red line is the actual contributions, and the blue line um, is the um, is the actually recommended contribution. You see the variance between them, and you see the decline um, if you use the EAN method. Um, so the reality is that the numbers back then, and I remember one person, I'm not going to say names saying, well, we didn't put as much in, but the number didn't change. So we'll worry about that down the road. It did change. You didn't measure it right. You know, um, an analogy that's uh, been used in the past is that if you go to the doctor's office and the blood pressure machine isn't working um, and they take and you say and you and, you know, they uh, take that and they take your, your pulse and everything um, and you go home, the scale's not working. Uh, and you're in perfect health, you know, you, you, you might have different habits than if you knew it was higher. And this is part of the problem in the teacher system that the methodology that was in statute, we immediately recommended to the General Assembly that that be corrected and you folks did that. So, or you folks did it. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the question on, on the past underfunding, uh, clearly it's been more prevalent in, in the teacher system, has yes. more, more of a, had more of an impact there. But, um, Understanding that the, the state system was fully funded in 2007 with the assumptions at the time, that doesn't mean that all the contributions were made. You know, maybe if we were 108% funded, we would have been able to withstand the shock from the Great Recession a little better. Um, I have not seen the, I've only seen the, been able to find the contribution histories for the state system, maybe back 15 years or so. Um, if, if that is available to the treasurer's it is. office. It is. Um, I, I think that would yeah. be helpful. I would well, say largely the, the state received uh, uh, pretty close or, or the, the, the amount. And the way that the state does it, they assess it as a percentage of payroll and we tend to underestimate the payroll. So in many cases, the state actually had more than 100% of the contribution. Um, the, the difference um, again um, is that coming into the great recession and, and then some of the assumptions, again, salaries are different than we expected. Um, workforce changes, the retirement incentives in 2010 and 2016 are mind boggling to me. Uh, you made an, there was a, 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 um, an assumption about how much the unfunded liability would go up and how much the ADEC would go up, but it would be offset by operating costs. And number one, again, that's that same property tax um, pension equation, um, but the idea was they were going to leave, I don't remember the number, Michael, but it was something around 100 positions vacant uh, after the 300 or so, and between 2010 and 2014, uh, the state added 543 positions. Um, I remember that number because I, I talked about that many times. Now, I'm not a workforce expert. I can't tell you whether you needed those positions or not. That's not my job. Um, but recognize that when you do those things, now you've increased the normal cost. And when you now change assumptions, that's had an impact on the unfunded liability. Not, when you start, it's a normal cost, but when you change liabilities and you have these people in for that period of time, you know, it has some impact on the overall health of the plan. Thank you. Um, Beth, on page 16 here, it shows 2001 to 2005, looking at the yep. um, actuarial recommended values versus what the contribution levels mm -hmm. were. Um, do we have the historical data pre-2001 also up to 2008, I believe it was 2008 when the ADEC yeah. was being funded again um, fully? And sure. So second part to that question. Yes, sorry again. Is, do we know? I get excited about talking about this. So I'm not happy with why we're talking about it, right. um, but it is uh, a topic that's near and dear to my heart, but it's also... I don't want to understate um, the, the seriousness of this. It really is. And now I'll stop interrupting you. Go for it, Eric. Oh, students out there, numbers are fun. People enjoy talking about them. <laughs> um, so just thinking about that, do we have an actual dollar amount on the underfunded amount in the teacher system? Um, and not just the dollar amount, but the um, lost opportunity cost of, of investments and returns since sure. then, kind of how that okay. plays into this. Okay, so the chart on page 16 has two pieces. One was the, in, the difference between the EAN 
and the, um, the uh, frozen initial liability. We did not go back further than 2001 on that because A, there's a cost and, and we wanted to get to what the sense of the, uh, the funding issue. The difference between the red line and the blue line are on page 18 of the package. And uh, you'll see, and I highlighted in yellow and put in red, um, the, the serious levels of underfunding. And uh, the, um, we can try to calculate that. There's a little bit of a nuance. One of um, the folks that talked at the public hearings, I said, um, uh, uh, I don't know if he's a math teacher or not, but he should be. Um, and he took a look at the interest rates at the time and calculated that. But there is a little nuance there as well, which is when you do the ADEC and you haven't calculated and the gains go up, you now amortize that over a period of time. It's sort of like a, um, a home equity loan on top of your mortgage, okay? And as a consequence, some of that is being repaid, but it's being repaid in that mortgage over time. Um, that's a little more difficult to calculate. We can have a conversation if folks think that that is worth it um, in terms of your decision-making process, but it will cost you some money. I would love okay. to see that. I think okay. it's a really important piece of information. Um, you know, when you're trying to put together a puzzle and you're missing a couple of pieces, it's a little frustrating to, yep. to have. And again, um, what our... Uh, and I do want to get back to uh, a motion that uh, this teacher board did on terms of the interactions between you folks and ours with respect to the actuary. And um, I can do that perhaps after we take a, I assume you're going to do a break someplace in this because you don't want to listen to me for, uh, uh, again, add on and add on. But um, here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's why she took the padded chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you're gonna do. You're gonna do best with that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Jeff, can you talk a little bit more about the impact of the salary expectations or assumptions on the unfunded liability? Sure. So an actuary will take a look at um, uh, several components when they're looking at um, uh, the um, uh, the infl uh, the salary as well as cola and the like. And I'm trying to find the page in the presentation that will help with that, uh, page 24. And economic assumptions um, are interest rates, salary increases, payroll growth. As you see that inflation's a big factor and that number is suddenly changed post COVID. Where it's, you know, how long it stays, we'll see. That productivity is, is taking a look at um, uh, income levels, GDP and so on. And, and what the, the, the increase in productivity and what the increase in uh, salaries are, um, uh, nationally, but you see that um, payroll growth and they make an assumption. They make assumptions about COLA, they make assumptions about salary increases, not just payroll growth, which is that productivity side and that GDP, but what is this career at the salary scale? Uh, what is the, um, again, that productivity, that, uh, that piece there, which is, um, uh, I'll try to give you a better definition of that down the road. I, I've been trying to um, put that together with different actuarial interpretations of it and inflation. So there was a scale that's built in. And in the actuarial report, you see that scale and it's by, uh, it's by um, ages and it also has uh, by um, uh, uh, when you started, so years of service. At the front end, at least in the state system, you have more raises or more uh, step increases um, at the front end uh, than you do at the other. So it takes a look at all that and averages it out. Um, in the teacher's system, uh, those assumptions um, have been made in the teacher's system from 2011 to 2020, the actual salary changes for teachers has been less than that. So actual um, is- Are you saying if I was paid more, mm -hmm. contribute more, 5% of more is more? Uh, no, I guess what I'm saying is, um, is that uh, it's an actuarial gain because the teachers did not have the same increases in, um, in, in salary that were the assumptions. Now, again, I don't know how the assumptions make sense to public policy at the local level of how much you should be paying a teacher. And by the way, I think teachers do a fantastic job and, uh, you know, uh, along with social workers and a number of other, at, you know, tough positions, um, uh, you know, I, I, I like teachers, what can I say? They have an incredible job and they make a real difference in, the, in future generations in terms of citizenship and, um, and their ability to be part of the economy as do all jobs. I have a real high respect for public service. But in the case of the teacher system, those salaries increases were lower than the expectation and the assumption. In the state system, they were the other, okay? Now, 
That doesn't mean that collective bargaining on the state system uh, created a bad result. I'm not an expert on workforce, and I'm certainly not an expert on what the, the prevailing rate should be. But based on the data that the actuaries had, and based on the best estimate, they put in salary assumptions and there's variations against it. I'm just kind of interested in that because if the salary changes were lower than expected, you know, like Kate was saying, that means that less money is going into the system, but it also means, I guess, at the other end that retirees had a lower final three years and maybe yep. that takes precedent. That's part of it. And also um, sal contributions go to the normal cost. Um, so the employee, the, the formula is employee contributions go to the normal cost and then employer contributions are a combination of what's needed to complete the normal cost. That how much do you need um, for, for Beth or that 30 year old or Michael um, or um, any of you, um, Molly, how much are we going to need in terms of, you know, put aside for that normal cost. So employer pays a portion of the normal cost and when you look at the ADEC you see it's broken up between normal cost and unfunded liability. And then the balance of the employer cost goes to the, um, uh, to the unfunded liability as part of the ADEC. So yes, there's an interaction. You're gonna have a different AFC average final compensation at the end, you know, in terms of those, but in addition to that employee monies are, are, are moving are directed toward the uh, normal cost. Well, and the reason I was asking about that is because I think it, it's hard to know how any given change we make is gonna affect the numbers because you, sure. you know, like say for example, that a teacher retires earlier than another teacher. Well, they're retiring on a lower salary um, for the local school district. That means that there's you know, a lower salary presumably of an incoming teacher, but then that money that's, that that incoming young teacher is putting into mm -hmm. the system is gonna build over time yes. a much longer period of time. Yes. So how do we even begin to distill out how the choices we make? Okay. So we can give you examples. After we finished our report, uh, what we did is we asked the actuary to take a look and we gave them real people without their names and uh, without their social security numbers. And uh, we gave them real people uh, different types, you know, that 30 year old, that mid career person, that person that was going to take early retirement. And we said, how, this, how is it going to affect that individual, what their retirement would look like? And we did that a number of scenarios. We can do those once you start to come up with some ideas. Or if you have a scenario, you want us to test and what that does to the individual, um, because we think that's important to know what it does to the individual. I think that's extraordinarily important. If you want retirement security, you need to understand what the impacts were. And some people had more gains and, some pe and other people had losses. Obviously, since we had, we were reducing the unfunded liability, um, there were more losses than gains in that process. Um, but uh, we can certainly provide that for you. So once you have a sense of what your scenario might look like, we can apply it to different folks in our system. And literally, the retirement system came up with a series. We talked to the actuary about which ones they think would be helpful. And then we gave them those real, real people uh, without the names, and then they did the uh, calculations. We can do that for you. I just want to make sure, Beth, I'm understanding this correctly, that so back in 2009, actuaries made an assumption that teacher salary growth would be at a higher level compared to what actual real life events took place over the past decade. The teacher salaries have not grown to the point that actuaries assumed they would, yes. which because of that lack of growth, it actually was in a way a gain for the system because it didn't cost as much money to the system. That's correct. The only difference is that we did experience studies in 10, 15 uh, 20, uh, we did a mini one in 2017. Um, so those assumptions have changed since 2009 and have evolved. But again, what happens at the, um, uh, in terms of the whole, particularly in the teacher's side, um, uh, well, actually both, uh, you know, you've had a lot of interaction with policy decisions around um, workforce and on the state side as well. Um, you know, again, I'm not going to suggest that, that I have no idea where those positions, those 543 positions I mentioned earlier went and how that divvied up. We need to do a better job. Again, I'm not gonna do it, okay? Uh, HR will have to volunteer for this one. Um, uh, I'll tell uh, uh, Commissioner Fastigi that I, I just volunteered her for something. But uh, we need to do a better job about workforce and where they're deployed. You know, And, and I take a look um, and I see issues in, in, in some places, corrections, for instance. Uh, you have a lot of overtime costs 
because of the number of staff that you have there. And you can't go home and say, well, you know, uh, my, my replacement didn't come in. So I now I'm going home and, you know, um, the folks um, um, in, the, uh, in the facility, you know, would you, they just have to wait for the next crew. Um, um, you can't do that. So we have overtime costs. What are the overtime costs in relationship to if you hired more individuals? Uh, where's the, where is, do we have the right distribution of folks? Those are questions that need to be answered and they, I'm not gonna answer them. Uh, you need other types of professional help, but they will bear on the decisions that are made here because overtime gets into your average final cost, for instance. So these are really terrific questions. Thank you. Continue on. Go for it. Okay, so I'm gonna try to move up a little bit. Actual gains and losses on page 19. I'm just gonna hit the key points and then try to go through some of this. You know, we have losses every year. I think we've talked about that. Assumptions don't actually match um, and you have to retool and, and, and those over time. Some of those are in our control. Some of them are not, as I said, uh, Vermont's a great state, but we're not gonna probably change the infl national inflation trends. And we're certainly not gonna um, have an impact on what they voted in, in England, for instance. Um, you know, the Asian um, crisis um, a few years back. Um, uh, we don't have a control over that. And my favorite one is the, um, uh, the Fed monetary policy, which they call taper tantrum, tapering of the, of the, um, uh, of the, the um, treasuries and how they're, you know, how much they're buying, for instance, and the tantrum is the part, the, the market's reaction to it. So, um, but we, we try to, we try to true up for those. Um, and then you have uh, uh, different types of gains and losses. And there's a chart in here we'll get to uh, momentarily on those. Um, the experience study, the recommendation, uh, moving from five to three years, uh, we concurred with that. I think that we were talking in the same direction. That's great when all, all minds are working in the same direction. I think that uh, all of us in the room can agree that that's, that's helpful. Um, we'll get to the patterns. Um, I think the last comment, and I quoted directly from a, a memo from Siegel, actual assumptions are used to estimate the plan's future benefits and payments, but they do not determine outcomes. Ultimately, the outcome will be how much did you earn? How much did you contribute? What were the salary changes? How much did you get in retirement? The assumptions are helping is a planning tool. They help us get there. They help us understand the scope of the issue if, if things don't go the way uh, 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 that, well, what, what it looks like if they do go that way, what the assumptions will look like and what, how bad is uh, our plan funded position and what do we need to do to correct it? But assumptions also um, uh, are just that. They're assumptions, they're guideposts, they're for planning purposes. Real behaviors make the difference and ultimately where we come through on this. So page, um, page 20 is the, um, is the cumulative um, uh, uh, losses in the, in the visa system. Now you notice I went to 2007. Remember I pointed out that uh, in 2007, um, that's when you started to see some, some changes in, in terms of the impact that, um, that uh, the, uh, the change in methodology had uh, in terms of mostly the state uh, teachers, but it did have some minor impact on the state, but since they were funding it, it, it wasn't as big a deal. Um, and then I wanted to get what post-recession looks like. Now, 2011 is mostly uh, post-recession, but in the case of investments, we smooth those over a five-year period. So if you take a look at 08 and 09 being your biggest chunk of change in terms of losses, if you, over a five-year period, you're still gonna have those monies into 2013 or so. Um, so if you take a look at this, again, the, um, um, the, the big ticket items for the, uh, for the state system, I do need to put my glasses on for this. If you take a look at the, uh, the positive numbers. So retirement gains and losses is a part of it. I think the retirement incentive is a part of that. Um, you take a look at the other gains and losses, which um, uh, would probably include the retirement uh, as well, plus changes um, in, in the way benefits were calculated and, and some of the changes in the systems over time. Um, 95, you take a look at, uh, again, um, I gotta do, do this uh, with the paper here. Um, uh, it's, um, salary, as I just said, that 95 million, I take a look at um, uh, uh, investment gains and losses were about 56 million. Some of that again being phased in from the recession. Um, mortality, 
um, you know, people were living longer. We had to make those changes. So you see, we, we went from 293 million um, in unfunded liability to a billion 40. And these are the components of what made it go up and down. If you look at the teacher system, which is page 21, and this, by the way, is what you should be looking at to the questions that you folks have had. What are the drivers? And what do you have in terms of ability to influence those drivers? You're not going to increase, you're not going to influence mortality, all that Vermont's a great state to live in a healthy state. Um, but um, you can have an influence on retirement experience, for instance. And what are we doing uh, that incentivizes people to retire. Um, and uh, that's an issue. Uh, again, the retirement incentives worked away from a good pension system. They helped on the operating side, but there has to be balance. On the teacher's yes, system, that, yes. I'm not sure if this is a legitimate question or not, but and I don't think it's necessarily a question for you, but in terms of what we can um, control and what we can't control. So any, we can only make decisions about the retirement funds and the benefits and the contributions and stuff. But we, we can't control what local decisions are made. I mean, talking about the teacher's fund now, not the, yes. not the state employee's fund. Um, so, but we, can't, we have no control over those decisions. And how, so how do we determine how those decisions might impact or offset or reverse any sure. any um, decisions okay. we we make, and I don't I don't know. I just think that's just something that we need to we need to address. It's not necessarily for you, but it is something that's out of our control that does impact this. I think there are a couple of pieces that I remember way back, and um, um, I remember um, uh, uh, talking to Representative Swaney about this and the disconnect because it's local. And they set the salary levels, they set the, um, uh, uh, make the, the decisions there. But uh, we made the decisions about appropriations. And I think the disconnect was, well, we don't have control over this. And there was something in the mindset that said, if we're, not, we're gonna skimp on something, it's gonna be that because we don't have control over the decisions that are impacting this. That was a mistake, but I heard that. And I don't know if every legislator or every government official or every board member or every member of the treasurer's office at the time had that uh, perspective. But because we don't have decision-making around the policy pieces around many of those, not all, you have, a, you have that disconnect. And that's where the, um, um, I, it's the only thing I can think of in terms of why you underfunded one versus the other. Um, so I think that that's part of it, but you do have some, you know, some, impact on, you know, through education policy and education funding on what decisions are made at the local level, um, whether it's, you know, the changes that were made with Act 46 or whether there are changes that are made in terms of, uh, I'm gonna not, someone's not gonna like the word I'm about to use, but mandates about property tax increases. Um, you know, those things have an impact. Whether or not the retirement incentives that, that, that were happening, and I believe to some extent are still happening for teachers, uh, whether or not there should be a, a cost piece to the state when you push up the, the benefits and whether that's through the education fund, I just hit one of the, uh, one of the third rails by saying that, um, but are, there are ways that you can address it. And I think that it's important to take a look at what's driving the teachers. And if you look at it, $319 million of the changes um, were um, turnover, turnover, which is, you know, members and terminations and staffing issues at the local level. And then you take a look at retirements, gains and losses combined. And that's on the next page. Um, I was pretty close, 39%, um, the increase, the $482 million related to that. Um, we broke these out a little differently. Um, and that's not, uh, I think um, uh, the JFO report aggregated the, the demographics and we thought breaking them out would be a, um, a helpful. Um, and by the way, their report, I reconciled it to ours and it's 100% correct, okay? So thank you in terms of those numbers. Um, but uh, I, um, I had the reconciliation back here if anybody wanted to look at it. But 39% um, of the increase in liabilities is related to that, those two items. They're offset by salary, uh, they're offset by other pieces but the reality is that's a big chunk of change and what can you do in policy decisions that have an impact on it? And I guess if I were a, if I were a current teacher 
paying into the teacher retirement system and understanding the impact that these decisions have on the health of my fund, I, I would be rightfully um, wanting to concentrate on that. And I, I hope that we will continue to drill down on that to understand the extent to which the advantage of retiring a, a high salary teacher to the local school district may be great for the local school district's bottom line. It may not be great for the remaining teacher's retirement system. So what I would say to you is right on. That's exactly the point. Um, and looking at this thing as a totality, as opposed to you know that division. And, and who should bear that? Who should bear yeah. the cost of that? Because right now, Absolutely. it is the teacher retirement fund that's bearing the cost exactly. of that, not the local school district. Um, I'm hitting on that uh, that uh, third rail again and, and, and some really yeah. tough decisions okay. around that, but it We're is something that you need to look at. out on the table. We you got to it. talk about this. Yeah. yeah. And I just wanted to add to that. It's interesting when you juxtapose it with the, I don't know how many people here have seen the article in Vermont Digger that came out last night about teacher shortages and the, you know a county in west of Rutland has was hiring over 25% of their staff this summer. Yep. So talk about teacher turnover, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's a big piece for us. And we try to get at this with the actuaries. When Act 46 and you had school consolidation, if you don't have a contract at the end of the year, you end up in an actuarial bucket called inactive. And we did, you know, trying to work through that. So what we did is we walked through and took a look historically, did those teachers that did not have a contract get uh, picked up in a, in a school and we're able to resolve some of that. But uh, those are big issues. Um, and looking at that, it's tough, but I would recommend getting to your point uh, that, we, that you take a look under the hood and look at what you can do here. So we're gonna do some work, sorry, Eric. We're gonna do some work on demographics this afternoon and mm -hmm. we've got HR coming in to talk about the demographics of the state workforce, but there, it's, it's more difficult to get a fine grain understanding of the demographics of the teacher workforce um, because we're sort of, you know, we need to look at data, you know, from the retirement office or from the teacher health insurance office yeah. as sort of a proxy for that. And I'm yeah. just wondering um, if there are other sources sure. of, of being able to understand, you know, mm -hmm. how many early retirements were offered, what was the benefit that was offered to the two teachers either across a district or across the state, because I think we should understand what that has looked like historically Yes, and assume that we want to have a better understanding of that going forward to know it's sure. impact to the teacher retirement. Would fund. AOE have that at all or? You know, I, I asked or, Jeff way back okay. uh, about right. this and we were trying, we ended up with some anecdotal data, which is described on page 23. Um, but we think that we need to take a good uh, look at the contracts as well. Um, excuse me. Uh, let me find. Uh, yes. So this was based on some communication between uh, Jeff and myself back in 2017. And we brought some of this, you know, in. I think I, I used it's anecdotal. We know some schools, we don't have a full picture. I think the, uh, the, the testimony I had was I went to a bookstore. Um, and the person behind the desk said, I'm a teacher, uh, retiree now. Thank you for the good service from your office. And it's fantastic. Those people do a great job. Um, but um, with the retirement deal I got, I couldn't pass it up. Okay. And I started to say to myself, well, what's going on here? And how many of those are happening? We know in the state system because we're a single employer, and, and, but we don't know what's happening here. So back in 17, the, the rough estimate that uh, we had was slightly less than 50% of the schools have some type of process. It may fluctuate. Um, Jeff's gut feeling, if I can skip to you, Jeff, is that there's less of that now than there are. But when we talk to retirees, we do hear, well, I have to make a decision about retirement because I have, you know, whether I get this incentive or not. Um, so we don't know. There's no current data. Um, we are going to look and see if we can get contracts from different schools. Um, and see if, the, if we can get some sense of what those contracts are, where they are provisioned. Some of them are ad hoc. Um, it's not in a contract. Some of them are contractually and try to take a look and see if we can get a handle at least on where it's happening and then maybe ask the, um, the LEA of the school to give us some more information. Um, we did see some geography in this. 
Um, and uh, that uh, at least on the, the, the materials, and I really appreciate Jeff getting this to us. Uh, during the, the, the southern part of the state has less of these than, than um, uh, the, the mid uh, part of the state. But we can take a look at contracts, get some idea of what's going on, but that's gonna take some work. But I think it's work um, that would be um, um, well suited to, to, to getting to the solutions. Just, I just want to bring something up sure. because you've accurately reflected this on page 22. And I just want to make sure that everyone hears this um, because I've been getting a lot of communications from folks. And the first thing they say is that you need to, you need to uh, fully fund the pension every year. And I tell them we have been since 2007, yep. both sides. Yep. However, this does accurately reflect that the, the healthcare, the OPEC, the absolutely was actually coming out of the corpus, even though we fully funded the pension every yep. year. Absolutely. The corpus of the fund was paying for OPEC. Now, yes. until somebody named Ron Huber and you and a couple of others got together in 2015. Ah, Ron, yes. He went through every amortization table we had to check them. And he told us we were right, but uh, but it was uh, but it was an interesting there, there process. Was just right there, and what yep. really got going to finally turn it into a, what is now termed a pay out. You know where we're not pulling money out of the corpus of the fund to pay for OPEC. It's actually yep. coming out of uh, operated funds. At right. Time. You're going to love the number just, on that. I just wanted to put that because yep. people have. It's what I've been the first time I've yep. been here. Yeah. You're not fully funding them. We exactly. Go to page seventeen. Um, and uh, I agree, mostly in principle, I have a few nuances with um, you know, some of the discussion that's happened on this and, and reports that you received. It had no impact on the change from 2020 uh, to 2021 um, for the unfunded liability um, and no impact on the, um, on the ADEC. It did, however, lower the levels coming in Great Recession that, and, uh, and frankly, you know the ability to recover when you're in a in, in a lower funded position, and uh, and your point the the 175 million of um, 2000 to 2000 and uh, from 2007 to 2020. Now, healthcare numbers, I can get numbers from 2001 up. Uh, the state went through a a, a change. Um, uh, Michael, you probably heard stories about vision. Actually, Michael in the auditor's office wrote an audit report about. Um, what I would call the um, fiasco in, in implementation. Um, but uh, I can get numbers from 2001 and try to estimate the impact, but the, uh, it, it does have an impact um, on, on the ADEC still because of that mortgage situation. But you're absolutely right. But the, the point I, I yep. want to make is we didn't underfund it. Yep. We were pulling funding out of it yes. in order to pay for it. We exactly. Did, we did not underfund it from yep. 2007 going forward. Yes, you know, I've been on that committee upstairs since since for the last ten yep. years, and we have dogged and determined it, funded fully. Absolutely, the ARC and now the ADEC. Well, yeah, but we're only funding in the in the exactly in the pension system. We're not funding the OPEB on a pre-funding you know, basis. You know, yeah, is all is all yep. taken. And you're going to see that I'm going to make a too. big push for that. I just but, just want to because yeah. people don't yeah they don't understand. Okay, so the change we made to go to PAYGO instead of putting it on our credit card, which is essentially what you're going to do, is mind boggling. It was a $480 million benefit to, um, to, to the system um, and to lower the cost for taxpayers. And, and when I say taxpayers, by the way, I should say other taxpayers when I'm referring to employee groups because 78% of employees in the state system that retire reside in Vermont, pay taxes in Vermont, 75% of the teachers. The myth that they all run to Florida is just wrong, okay? Um, some people live, New Hampshire, Florida's next, New Hampshire's next after that. And some people, I have a staff person that lives in New Hampshire. So my presumption is at retirement, he's probably gonna continue to live in New Hampshire. He should come to the great state of Vermont. But um, the, um, the reality is that $480 million by making that change in 2014, you enacted it and it was implemented in 2015. It was one of the highlights of, of our office in terms of uh, working with you. And yes, Ron went through those piece by piece with us um, um, and uh, it was an arduous process, but it was worth every penny. So, Eric and it was a lot of pennies. Eric has a question. Sure. Thank you. So th I think this has been a really helpful dialogue in terms of what's driving um, some of what we're seeing. And 
uh, I want to dig in on the turnover piece a little bit, just so I'm understanding it correctly. So when we think about solutions, we can tailor them to the, the drivers. Um, tur that turnover being a driver of unfunded liability, that I assume that is um, people leaving sooner than you actuarially assumed they would continue in the workforce. Yeah. It's behavior changes. Um, uh, retirements um, are a little easier to, to understand because, and this is not the case in every once everybody says you're going to lose a whole people and that's going to impact the system. Yes, it will impact the system, but not everyone who retires is an actuarial gain. Um, some folks are, some aren't. When you terminate um, or you have turnover, you're hired and rehired, and, and those are a little more ambiguous in terms of the in, impact from person to person, but clearly um, it has an impact and we can dig deeper under, I haven't dug enough under the whole, uh, under the hood there. We can dig deeper on that. Thank you. Uh, this might be going back maybe 10 minutes now, but it's just a thought that's been percolating in my mind. Um, so thank you for bearing with me on this. Um, just trying to make sure I understand the idea that when locals offer an incentive for a teacher to retire, it helps the local budget. Um, which helps the local taxpayers there. However, it, it is a drain on the pension system because people are retiring earlier, so they're taking their pensions earlier. Yep. However, at the same time, if, if teachers work longer, it puts more burden on the local budgets and less of a burden on the yes. pension system. That's the that's the look at it and balance the holistic approach. You know, instead of you know pressing the balloon at one end, um, taking a look at the, the whole thing. Now, the people that um, that retire that are actuarial gains because a lot of folks when they get to the to their um, more mature age, okay, <laughs> um, um, they um, they're more some some of them are maxed out on their steps. Some of them uh, they're going to get cost of living adjustments. But we refer to them as actuarial gains to the system. I was at a, um, a retirement party for uh, someone, and I remember I got up and called him an actuarial gain. And at least uh, Suzanne Young understood what I was saying. But um, um, not everybody, but mo uh, many, OK? Um, so when you do that, you end up putting pressure. They're retiring early, so you're paying out dollars. You lose that actuarial gain that they have in terms of their salary position. and. Uh, uh, so it has an impact directly there. Again, the other one is a little more amb ambiguous in terms of the decisions that, uh, that impact that, but uh, we will get more information for you. Thank you. And it feels like it kind of speaks to the complexity of all of our considerations yes. thinking about, okay, well, if we do make this change, how that impacts human behavior um, and you know, thinking about yep. it, teachers who are at their bottom step, think their max amount are standing for extra time, how that forces local school districts into making difficult choices. Um, I think I've heard repeatedly over and over that the easiest way to trim a budget is by cutting people. Absolutely. Um, which of course cutting teachers um, really has a terrible consequence on the education of our students and yep. the, um, our communities and the impact yep. there and the services that we can provide. Yep. So it really does speak to all those pieces we need to consider when making it. Absolutely, system. absolutely. It, um, uh, this is complex, but you're, you're asking the right questions uh, in this. So thank you. Yeah, there's a follow-up to sure. question. I'm glad it passed it, but that was a good question. Right? Is there anything on the front end of, of a teacher's career so in terms of turnover within the first five years of the best, before the best period that's impacting this number as well? Um, I'd have to go look at the benefit. We made some changes to that in the teacher system in 2009 so that when you left, we calculated an actuarial um, impact of that and adjusted um, uh, uh, for that in terms of um, uh, Michael, are you, you remembering this? There's a, there's a, yeah, yeah. But I'm uh, the individual when they leave, um, they get their inter their, their money plus a percentage, and we try to calculate that to make it actuarially neutral, I believe. But we need to take a look at that whether those assumptions hold. I'm now getting into I'm. Thinking about the, uh, you have it uh, someplace in your materials, the uh, the group plan matrix. Um, I'm a little foggy on this one, and I'm going to have to follow up. Yeah. When, when can we expect to see updated numbers with FY21 close out and increased gains from the 24% return? Sure. So um, we do our evaluation um, process, and this is where we are going to have some. Uh, some competing needs for actuarial services. And I talked to the actuaries the other day 
and said, we're gonna need to ramp up um, and uh, because we anticipate a request from you folks, and we're gonna need to ramp up. Now, the problem with ramping up, by the way, I'm gonna get to your question in a second. Um, the problem with ramping up is that uh, uh, you need people that are also experienced in our system. So, you know, so they don't have to uh, get from zero to, to, to 60 in 4.3 seconds or whatever it might be. Um, so that's gonna be an issue. The boards did vote to say that, um, that they're more than happy to use, this is the teacher board, your, um, to share our services, but they also wanna make sure that our statutory requirements are met. Now, what happens, so this gets to your win. So what happens is we, we're finishing up right now, I think Monday, you know, trying to get people on onboarded that retired in June. Um, the numbers so far are a little less on the teacher system than last year. We won't have final numbers to Monday. And again, people can retire after that too, but you know, that's kind of a cutoff point that we're looking at. Um, then we close the system around mid-July. We, you know, we, we've, we've got our June numbers um, and what's happened in the year. We do some census work ourselves. The IT department works and we try to clean it up. On August 30th, we send that um, to the actuary, okay? And then they do a cleanup. So all through the month of um, September, they are doing cleanup on our numbers. They're looking and saying, that salary increase doesn't make a lot of sense to me. In the teacher system, for instance, the AFC um, is limited. Um, the amount that you can count toward the AFC is 10% in those last three years and anything above that isn't counted. Um, so there are different nuances. We gotta go through that. While they're doing that, our folks are doing the financial uh, statements and um, we do all of the financial reporting that's sent to the auditors that's included in the state's um, 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 annual co comprehensive report. Um, and that gets sent to the actuary on 9.30, okay? And then we combine those things and they do a report at the end of October. So we won't know the impact to October. Now, uh, there's a page in there that shows how they smooth it. So you're not gonna, the 24% is great. We're happy with it. It exceeds um, our, um, our uh, uh, one, three, five, 10, and maybe 15 year, I don't remember, um, uh, rate of return expectation. Those are volatile. You know, I won't say what organization, but an organization that was pushing um, an agenda would take the worst possible time, you know, the Great Recession, and put it there. Uh, you know who I'm talking about. But uh, so it can be endpoint sensitive when you take it in terms of economic cycles. But that 24% is great. But what's going to happen is that there's a difference right now between the actuarial and the market value. It's about 105% uh, roughly. So you're gonna need to make up that first. And then we smooth it over a five year period. So I, um, I took a shot at that the other day um, and uh, I need to kind of retool it a little bit, but you're not gonna get, which you, a billion one is what we, we collected. So this year our earnings are um, just over a billion one. The teacher system gets roughly 42% of that. The state system gets roughly 42. Um, and the remainder goes to 16% uh, if I'm doing the math right, um, to, the, to the municipal system. Um, so 42% of that, so you're talking, you know, 400 and what, $60 million. Um, you're going to get that. But again, part of it is um, to, to pay off the, um, the, um, the, the difference between those. And part of it will be smoothed over five years. And you say, why do we smooth it? Because if you use market value, you folks could never do a budget. Because one year, you know, when you have um, uh, a, a bad year, you're going to have to put in a whole bunch more than the next year it goes up. We said that problem with debt service. And um, uh, as they bring up his name, uh, Jim Reardon would say, you know, how come it was this year and this year, you know, um, everybody loved it when, when the debt service went down, but they weren't too happy the next year when it went up. So you try to smooth it for appropriation purposes. During the Great Recession, um, some folks um, decided that one way to handle that was to push out their five-year smoothing to 10 years so that there was less impact on the Great Recession. Unfortunately, when you get the snapback, you know, and, and the increases, they also uh, had trouble there. So some of them were trying to get the best of both worlds, 10, and then switch it back to five or something. So it won't all be there. Um, we won't know till October. I've got a I'm not prepared to say the number. I want to kind of walk it through with the actuary. I tried to replicate. I replicated their process that they used for the prior year and came within 3 million bucks, which isn't too bad. Um, I want to make sure that I'm doing it correctly this year and talk to an actuary about it. So before I hand out even an estimate, I want to have that, uh, that conversation. This one will be quick, I promise. Yes. 
Knowing um, that you were saying we can't get that report until October, but our task force is putting out the initial report in October. I think having that um, the past fiscal year returns just as a consideration for us for any decision making. What are the chances we could get that earlier than October? Well, if I if I talk just the investment piece alone um, and, and that smoothing, if I talk to the actuaries and their game in terms of the process that that I started to again replicate what they've done and see if I can get close. Um, and the, they will nuance it. I mean, they will they will take whatever I do and say, you forgot this, you add this, and da, 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 you know. But when we finish that process, we may be able to give you something a little further down the road. Okay. Now, keep in mind that that's just that piece. Your other gains and losses, how we do in mortality, how we do in retirements, we have no idea. But um, getting to page 24 and 25, I'll go to page 25. The, um, the, this is what you're going to use for inflation. And if you see their assumptions are 2.4 per year and 1.35, um, one of them gets half of it, one of them gets uh, full. Last year, the inflation rates uh, for the teachers, for instance, uh, was zero for group A and 1% um, and for group um, uh, B and C. Group B and C, I believe, get 50% of the COLA up to a ceiling of five, but a minimum of 1%. Group A gets the full COLA, but they, they, didn't, they don't round up uh, to a minimum of one. Um, that number is going to go up one way or the other. Uh, if you take a look uh, where that arrow is, 4.6% is the number. Uh, they may adjust it because they do they do go back and, and, and adjust these, but um, um, that's going to be an actuarial loss. So you've got a gain on the investment side. You're going to have a loss here, or at least at, at, at best, less gain than you had last year. Um, and then you've got the other pieces that I can't even begin to, you know, I, I can't tell you what the behaviors of um, state employees or teachers are. I know my behaviors, but I don't know everybody else's. So, so help. Yes. Okay. So that gets us back on to this. Um, again, um, I'm going to skip through most of the experience study because we've done that. Um, I did want to go to page 27. This was in our report, this came from the actuaries. Um, and uh, this is on our report uh, to you on January 15th. And it showed you, you know, again, that 216 million was directly related to the, um, to the experience study. And then in the case of the state system, another 8.2 million based on the valuation getting you up to that 225 million. I really wanted to get to a better sense of what the pieces were. Um, so in the next page, and this will be some time to digest, so I'll just explain it, and unless you have questions, I can attempt to answer. But um, you see that we broke this out um, to just the mortality, then mortality and turnover, then turnover and all other demographics, and then just the interest. Because when you look at their report, they had roughly, um, I think, Chris, uh, the number for all economic was around 157 million. Yeah, and, uh, and we broke it out and said, okay, how much of it is inflation versus investments? So we have a, and since inflation and COLA, which is an economic um, assumption, not a demographic, uh, the COLA was a gain, uh, you were masking the true cost of the investment. So we, we put that into this, uh, to this analysis. So you'll see uh, again on the, the items that, um, and we did this with the actuary did this to be very candid based on our discussions back and forth. Um, so you get a better feel for those pieces um, that kind of get lumped together um, in the experience study and the same with the teacher system. And I won't go any further on that today unless you really want to have that conversation. Um, but we can come back with any questions and I'm looking over at Andrew and he's looking at that chart. I have a suspicion that I might have some questions from you and from Eric and all of you. Um, people, you know, all of you have been asking terrific questions today. And I've been spending years talking to Representative Fagan about retirement. I mean, um, um, he's never bored with the conversation. He, he, he really, um, he's really into it as well. So folks here, you do a great job, you're informed and that's great. Investments, I'm gonna to touch on this briefly because this, I'm, you know, I'm not, not the chair of VPIC, and in fact, we are moving forward just to let you know on a lot of the changes pre the report. Um, so um, the meeting we have next week, um, I plan on resigning as vice chair and asking an employee representative to be, um, to be the vice chair. Um, that's my recommendation. The board could vote for anybody they want. I have one vote, um, but um, uh, I think that that's helpful. I have asked to be continue to be involved in the ESG, environmental, social, and governance. That's something that's near and dear to my heart. 
we get involved in those issues in our office as well. Um, clean water comes to mind, you know, um, but um, 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 uh, our, our involvement in the um, um, Global Warming Solutions Act and some of our testimony there. But um, I think, and we're also, we're talking about moving them in terms of space. We're talking about some of the functions. So we are moving fairly quickly on that, um, which is good. Um, but long-term view, something, I said roughly 60 to 62%, it's really closer to 62% of what's paid out to a retiree. That dollar you pay is uh, from investments. 24.62, um, a billion point one four, good numbers. Um, you see my good news, but investments are not gonna solve the problem in and of themselves. You still need to take a look at the structural changes. Um, expect some losses from COLA, which we just said, and it's too early for me to have any idea on what those others will look like. Um, these, this, the second page is the chart Tom Galanka provided to you your last meeting. However, it's been updated to the 24.6. The next chart, and this gets to why investment rate of returns, because there's a disconnect. Uh, folks think that the investment rate of return is going down because they're not getting the investments that they should. Um, that is simply not the case. If you take a look at the chart that you had in the beginning, again, economic cycles, I'll go back to that one that Tom sent out, whoa. Um, you see the red line, red or orange, it's, that's what the actual assumed rate of return is, and you're above and below it. That's what markets do. You have up years, you have down years. Um, but you see the cycle and where we are. And by the way, Tom pointed this out to, to, to me and to you folks in testimony. You see those big jumps back in the, the 80s and 90s? Um, that would have been a great time to have not underfunded your pensions. But, um, but um, so we do have ups and downs. That's what you expect in a cycle. And over in the corner are the, uh, some of the more important market events or more significant, not important. The next page is from... Um, uh, from NASRA. And, you know, um, Chris, you know that chart that you had in there? They do that every year. And that thing makes me dizzy. Okay. <laughs> you like that chart. Okay. Okay. I know the chart you're talking about. It took me a while to wrap my head around that, but I, I do like it now. Yeah, well, there you go. It is busy, though. Yeah, it is busy. <laughs> and I actually have that chart over a number of years, so I can provide that. But NASRA did this chart that just showed it in simple line graph, what the averages were. And look at inflation. That's driving the reduction in the rate of return. Getting back to your, the point I made earlier, the rate of return assumption helps you plan, but actual investment return will ultimately, just like actual retirements, actual behaviors, um, actual inflation are gonna determine where you end up in this thing. You do the best with the assumptions, but the inflation is, is doing this. Now, I have no idea uh, what it's gonna look like down the road. You know, I'm concerned about this one year, is it a blip? or is it a sign that inflation is, um, is, is going up? Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But this chart shows you that. And up on the top, I put where we were at approximately those times. So back in 02, we were at 8%. The average was at eight and five. We were above that in 05. We made a, what I think was not the best move in 05. We looked and said, we just created VPIC. So let's push up our return assumption a little bit. And that disconnect between what VPIC does and the assumption was not there. Um, I think that you see that trend down. And at this point, um, we're at 7% uh, 2019. If you go to the next page, um, the average as of May, now they update this all the time. So there's a July number. I haven't gone back to look at it. The mean um, is 7.13. The, the, the median is 7, and we're at 7%. So um, just uh, thought I'd point that out. The question is, is our smoothing? Um, in line with what other folks do. And as I said, during the Great Recession, some folks played with that a little bit, but it is. Uh, majority are in that five-year period. We're in that five, we have five years. And um, um, so it looks to me like those assumptions are relative, are reasonable and well within the range. The other piece of this, and I'm almost done folks, believe it or not. Um, and I did this a little different than Chris. I think you were trying to look more at cash flows. And I was looking at audited operating results. Um, and it gets very complicated because, you know, you can't invest in accrual, you know. Um, uh, I guess you can if you do some, some things on the margin um, in, in your own life, but I certainly wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, recommend that for a pension fund. But uh, so the blue thing is, uh, the blue line is the amount of um, uh, sources of funds. And we have a more detailed in our annual reports of what makes up those employee, employer, um, investment income. Uh, 
And then the orange number uh, or line is the actual application, paying of benefits, administrative expenses, and the like. And you see that all across in the visas, the the um, the um, uh, the payment of, um, of out the door is higher than the amount um, that's coming in. Now you want that to some degree. The purpose of having a pension plan is that you can get the value of investments to pay for those instead of taxpayer dollars. So you want that to some degree, but the bar is a little bit, the unfunded liability is a little bit skewed, a lot skewed actually, but the, the assumption, you know, someone was surprised when we said that, um, you know, that you're taking money out of the fund. Your corpus is going up, you, you know, your, your balance in the fund needs to go up. But the idea is that you're using investment dollars to pay for some of this, but you want the corpus to go up. You had a chart in there that I didn't include here, Chris, but you see that generally it's going up 2001, two, and obviously uh, <clears throat> 2008 wasn't a good year, um, but um, that, that pattern. Vistas has the same pattern. And you see that um, uh, they had some bumps in 2013 and 14. Some of that may be the teacher piece. I was trying to think of why last night, but getting to your point, Representative Fagan, that's the, you know that that might be that. And we solved it around 15. Um, the difference is Vemers. Vemers is a young fund, okay, relatively new. And you say 1974 is new, but if you go back to the 40s for the other funds, they are more mature and um, in terms of their their process. So in the front end, you're collecting more with the understanding that down the road, you're gonna use those dollars. And you see um, all the way across that this is a cash positive fund, okay? I put it in just to explain that it's, you know, we're not concentrating on that. Although you will see in 2009, that uh, eight, um, this was something that was done, uh, I was a deputy at the time, but I, I spoke against it. Um, they were in such a great funding position. They said, we're gonna take some money and we're gonna put it into like a cafeteria fund for healthcare. So they, they, you can't take it out of the corpus of the fund. That's not legal, um, but the contributions coming in, they made a statutory change that said, these are going to go toward healthcare. And then the great recession hit, okay? And um, so, uh, and once you put it into the healthcare, it's an irre irrevocable fund. So, but they, they haven't done it since, but that money is still there. Getting to the next page, this is the most common equation that people cite. Um, Eric is saying yes in his reading. Chris is saying yes in his reading. All of you that have done with pensions. So it's, you know, that it's contributions plus investment income uh, equal benefits paid plus expenses. That's what you want to see. Crossover, when this equation isn't working, you have a crossover event. Um, GASB calculates that for accounting reports. Um, it's not surprising that New Jersey had a crossover event, okay? Um, a couple of other states, um, but uh, uh, we do not have a crossover event at this point in time. We continue down the road, we could, but even more important, even before you get to the crossover point, you're gonna reach a critical juncture where the legislature when the governor and others are gonna say, taxpayers are gonna say, we can't do this anymore when you get to that $500 million, okay? Uh, you can't do this anymore and, um, and you, you, you end up not paying it or you end up creating systems that do not provide retirement security. Um, so that tipping point is why I'm so concerned about this because I want those next generations to have the opportunity for retirement security. Now you're saying, well, you're also cutting benefits in some of your proposals. There has to be that balancing because you want to have retire. You know, if they had done some of the changes in Social Security a little earlier, they'd be in less less bad. Is that a way to say it? Uh, um, uh, not in the same situation they are now. So, um, and uh, um, as all of us, I'm I'm probably not going to hit that tipping point there because I'm a little older. But that 30 year old um, is is definitely going to have some concerns about that unless Congress acts. Yes. Uh, Beth, before we leave investments, um, I, I apologize. This might not be the best question for you. It might be better suited for Tom. But um, has there been a look back at all in terms of um, our investment strategies when yes. our, our funds may have underperformed? I, I, I think yeah. Big is doing all the, good, yeah. all the right things right yeah. now. But just in terms of learning from yeah. uh, past uh, performance, um, I'm just curious. Big time. Back. Big yeah. time. And I think okay. that... Um, one of the things that was helpful uh, in the in this in Act 75 is that they put some 
uh, pieces in there that I think we were doing already to be very candid. We did not have them streamlined into one area for transparency. Um, we had it all out there, but it's, you know, trying to, trying to um, uh, navigate websites can be a little rough. So trying to do that, trying to also create a communication around it to employees, those are good things. But the practices that we've had were things that we were already moving on for the last five years. And I got to give Tom an incredible amount of uh, credit for this and the committee. If you took a look back to 2010, what our investment lineup looked like, I don't believe we have even one uh, manager that we had back in the, then. And our structure is different. Um, we have some downside protection. I believe, and I used to say this at committee meetings, it was um, uh, a difference that I had with um, some I won't say who, I should not be doing this, I apologize, um, that we had more downside risk. Now, some of that was legitimate coming out of the Great Recession. You didn't, especially the teacher system, it was so badly funded that it couldn't take another hit to be very candid. So you had to have downside protect, protection. I think we had just a tad too much. And we're trying to have the balance between growth funds and, and, and downside protections and inflation protection. Um, real estate is a great, um, at least pre-COVID, a, is a great um, inflation protection. Um, at one point, I don't know how we ended up there, but we had commodities uh, in there. I, I, I went holistic with you. You did. When I found that out. Yep. And, um, you assured me they were going to get out of it. And we did, because they that was assumed to be, um, and depending on who you talk to, including your investment consultants, that's a great inflation um, 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 uh, buffer. Um, I think that in, in hyperinflation, that might work, doesn't work with regular inflation. And we got the heck out of it. And I think that was an incredibly good move. So all of the things that we've changed, I think are to the good. I know that uh, Representative Fagan has spent a lot of time going over things. I think you're happy with the direction we're going. And I know um, uh, Representative Gannon, you spent some time with our investment folks. I'm not the, the person you should be talking about this, particularly now since Tom is the chair, VPIC is spinning off into its own entity, but we've made some incredible changes that I think are very good. Um, and uh, again, I think downside risk was important. Uh, I just thought we were a tad too far there. And um, so in boom markets, we didn't do as well. In, in down markets, we did incredibly well. But if you look at the market, overall, it's moving up. So you want to have a little bit more upside um, um, gains in, uh, than downside protection. I think we've made that change. So, I think I'm at the, oh, the one last thing is OPEC. Yeah, and so we have about 10 minutes before our noon break. And okay. we plowed through without a morning break. My apologies. Yeah. We, we usually try to put a break into but people get you're, up and you're about that than I am. Yeah. So I'm going to do this one in seven minutes. How's that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, fund the darn thing. Okay. Okay. We're okay, done. Got okay. Break. We <laughs> have presented pre-funding of proposals. We've talked about this since 2014 in the presentations we've made to, um, to GovOps, to appropriations, to um, ways and means, to finance. Okay. And 2019, we submitted a very good formal proposal on this. And then again, several times in 2020, 2021. The bottom line is just like in a pension system. If you pre-fund, you get to use those investment earnings to pay for healthcare. If you don't, what happens is that um, you, you're paying for dollar for dollar with tax dollars. And looking at the chart, I, I'll go past page 42, looking at the chart that we presented last year. If you, and that's based on interest rates that were in place last year. Uh, for treasuries. Actually, you have to use by, by law the 20-year uh, AA bond um, uh, uh, rate, uh, tre uh, not treasury, bond rate that's published in the bond buyer and other places. Um, using that, if you pre-funded, you would be saving in the teacher's plan $821 million over time, and the auditors and the actuaries would allow you to book this right away which really does a lot for your balance sheet. And you start earning those dollars over time because you're investing those dollars. Um, to me, it just blows my mind that we're not there, to be very honest. And someone said, you know, we don't want to be here in 10 years, you know, on the pension side, back here at the table. You are going to be back here at the table on this thing till you solve it, okay? We need to deal with this now. The numbers for the teacher system, um, the amount of money you need to put in is fairly fairly modest. The state system, it's a bigger lift, 
But with the revenue numbers that you had this year in the statutory piece that says that 50% of any monies after uh, surplus monies after uh, filling your uh, your mandatory and your your your, your reserves, 50% of that goes. My guess is uh, actually I know the number, but it's someplace around 50 million dollars is going to go back into the kitty for the state health care plan. And we may be able to take a look at those numbers and do a little better job. It's a heavier lift, but you got to get to the lift because we're talking $1.6 billion. We need to do it. We need to do it now. Um, you know, and we don't want to be here in 10 years saying, how did this help? Now, if you look at, uh, there's a chart in here at the end that has some of the initiatives that we've done. Um, at least I think it's here. Um, maybe I didn't put it in, um, but um, uh, we need to, uh, we've done a lot on the liability side. We've done changes. It's tiered healthcare, so you have to work longer to get a subsidy, um, and and that subsidy changes over time. Those things have added a lot of um, of savings to it. And uh, Michael, I'm going to be careful here, but we are we will be um, announcing a change um, that will actually enhance benefits and lower the premiums uh, for one of the systems. Uh, and we'll be announcing that in early August, I hope. Uh, we'll I can't give you any more details. At our own you got meeting. it. You got it. Because we 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 can't get ahead of the contracting right. process and, and the like. But it's a substantial decrease in premiums. It will impact the OPEB over time, which is a good thing. That doesn't mean you shouldn't pre-fund. You still need to do it. But since it will be effective in January, it won't be you know a full year and then the next year. So if you ask me how much it's going to impact the OPEB, we're not there yet. Yeah. And that ends my presentation. Except we're for we're not going to talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I wasn't talking about it. I was oh. Back to the oh. Okay. I'll ask you. Yeah. Okay. I, I just I had um, said that we wouldn't entertain any conversation about that because it's still in negotiations. Okay. About the right. No, about, I think she wants to ask a question no, about the, the presentation asking. as a whole. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. I thought oh, you were going to. I, I thought. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Fiona. <laughs> Don't ask your question. <laughs> so much, so much for that um, part no, of the no, beginning no. about um, you no, know no, the. Uh, I, I just. I, I know. I know. I, I, I know. Was, I was I'm just having fun with you. Up, so yeah. I just. Um, Senator, okay. I'm just having a little fun with you. You know. Yeah, so hey. No, no. I just. And I again, I recognize want to go the seriousness. Ahead of that because I already promised that I wouldn't. But go ahead with your question, Leona. <laughs> there you go. We try to remember what it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, looking at the OPEP, you, we, we've um, discussed and looked at a lot of it around mm -hmm. um, pre-funding. Is it the upfront cost that has been the biggest? Um, if you take a look at the states, uh, the teacher system, mm -hmm. um, go back to that chart. We were yeah. talking about um, uh, the premium was forty-one point eight million yeah. as it exists now. We were talking about thirteen point three and six million, you know, as a starting principle. So we were talking. You know, 20 million bucks. Okay. Yeah. And then we said for the next three years, the premium would have to increase three or four years. I think it's three now, would have to increase at 10% increments. So you would have to put in 10% over the premium, yeah. which isn't a ton of money. Um, and then 3% thereafter, which is close to the rate of inflation, might be less than the rate of inflation down the road, and you get to pre funding. The state system is a bigger lift. Um, because it, um, while it um, has some money in the kitty, because we had 50 some odd million already, and with this other, we'll have about 100 million in the kitty um, to help with this. Um, it, um, um, the numbers and the premiums and, and the costs are higher. Um, and I, you know, I know you've asked me uh, uh, several times to get into, you know, what some of the differences are. I know that there's a difference between spousal and family uh, um, care, and the tiers are a little different. But I just we have more interaction on the on the teacher side. We healthcare on the state side is part of collective bargaining. Basically, whatever the state that the, the active employees get, they get in in, in retirement uh, the benefit structure. We don't have as much visibility into that under the hood. Um, but um, I don't. I I know that um, I saw a representative again and say, well, that's still money. Um, but you know, when you're talking about the the power of investing. Um, that was a nice chart that you had in yours, uh, you know, power of compound interest. Um, I think it's time to do it. Okay. And the time to do it is now. Thank you. Sorry, Leona. <laughs> well, actually, the time to do it was three years ago. But hey. I have a uh, brief request or a question about process. Um, you know, so several of us ask questions looking for information. 
what's our process of recording these so that we get that information? I'm thinking about getting that ballpark figure you're working on pre-October. Yep. Also, um, I had a question about the impact on the unfunded funds, um, where that would be yep. now. What's our process? We'll add it to that list of okay. things that we need. Yeah, gotcha. So we're, we've been asking. But someone's writing it <laughs> yeah. down. I think I that- I write those down, I hope you did. When you ask okay. <laughs> if you get those over to me, we will we will do that. Um, um, now I I'm going to okay. defer to the chairs about how you do that. Um, whether you, you you know streamline it and get it over to us. And again, we've asked in that um, that motion that was made, and I think it's consistent with uh, the board uh, teachers board that um, that everything come through one source. For instance, JFO um, to us. We do not want you know ten people calling and diffuse, and even worse. Uh, calling the, the actuary at you know a fairly high you know cost per hour, um, asking the same question or a variation of a theme. Um, um, I remember when I was a deputy, we had one member of one of the boards. Um, the folks in here know exactly who I'm talking about. Okay, uh, there's a smile behind there that would call the actuary directly, and I finally had to say, "You can't do that because you just cost us, and we were already doing this." Um, we need to have some control over that process. So it's up to the chair how that's communicated right. to us. I think that at the end, of, when we have our discussion at the end of today, we'll um, make sure that we have all of those things on the list and add them to the list that we've already started and then um, figure out when we're going to put them, when we're going to get them. Okay, great. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's fantastic. I just want to make sure I wasn't okay. sure if somebody had the assigned task of recording these types of questions, sir. Well, so, we'll make sure at the end yeah. of that that we get everybody's requests in okay. like we did great. before. So um, just in terms of you talking about demographics, I have not done the demographics for the um, uh, for the, re the active employees, but I did do it for retirees, fairly detailed. Um, um, Representative Gannon, I handed that out at the risk meetings, uh, the risk assessment meetings um, back in 19. It's not updated data, but it's pretty darn good. And it breaks it out between gender, it breaks it out years of service, the AFC um, by group plans. Um, and uh, it's, we have one for the teachers and one for the state. We'd be happy to send that over to you. I think it would be very instructive. Um, and I have to do this. Give me one more minute. It's not germane to this subject, but if you go completely, if you go to the report that the, the treasurer's report and you look at appendices F1 and F2, and I'm just gonna pull this out because this is a subject near and dear to my heart. It's about gender equity and pay, okay? So I'm gonna hold this up. So this is the state system. And you see that way back in 1980, and that yes, we do have retirees um, uh, that are, are still collecting benefit from there. You see the disparity between uh, uh, women and men in terms of retirement benefit. The, the average is in the middle. Um, the, there's a trend line there, but uh, I'll put it this way so you can see it as well. Um, it's gotten better. There's still a disparity, but it's gotten better. But this is something that I think we need to talk about too, outside of this, but I can't, I got to put a plug in for this about, uh, you know, disperse and pay. Some of it's related to the time that you're in the system, you know, your service time. The teacher's system has less disparity, but it hasn't changed much since the, um, uh, the early. So um, I just thought I'd point that out. And again, you see the counts at the bottom of how many people we have that are still collecting benefits from those ages. And that says something about the health of Vermont in terms of um, uh, folks. And the good news is that the living um, obviously has a cost impact, but um, I, I'm delighted to see those folks still collecting benefits. The last piece, and I think it impacts women as well as older retirees. Um, I was at a teacher um, every year I've gone to, a, not this past year because of COVID, a retiree meeting, uh, retired teachers association meeting in Rutland. And um, this person who spoke ahead of me talked, gave a, a presentation on how to, how to um, uh, apply for food stamps, okay? To me, after a full year of public service, whether in the state system or the teacher system, you should not be having to apply for food stamps. It's just a travesty in my, my opinion. My concern is the next generation, the generation after that, why we have to have retirement security and say, well, Beth, you're also talking about you know, benefit changes and, and the legislature is, we have to find that balance, but we have to continue to maintain retirement security. And as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, it's a massive increase in the bankruptcies for, for, uh, for older folks. 
this is something we should need continue to take a look at. I want security for the next generation, the next generation, as do you, but we need to take a look at that balance as we're looking at this. Um, that was mind boggling to me. And that was maybe four years ago, um, but uh, th that I heard that presentation, um, I was appalled. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna say before we, um, before we break for lunch, um, but thank you. I stay and if you want you, me to, but I don't you, think you do. <laughs> you said that um, you could control your own behavior and you could predict that, but you couldn't predict the behavior of teachers or state employees. And I will tell you that um, my guess is that most teachers and state employees are probably voters. Mm -hmm. And according to the Constitution, voters are required to be of a quiet and peaceable behavior. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, as I said, so seven, that we yep. can assume that they will all be of a quiet and peaceable behavior. <laughs> okay. Um, as I said earlier, 75% of the retirees um, in the teacher system live in Vermont, 78% um, in, in um, uh, the uh, state system. And my presumption is the active workforce probably follows pretty closely to that. So take it from there. Thank you. Great questions. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to go over this. Uh, you can tell I hate the situation we're in. And in all seriousness, um, it's mind boggling. We have to deal with it. It's painful. Um, but you can also tell I kind of get into the subject fairly deeply. Um, I'm happy to come back, answer questions. I do validate everything through the actuaries. And we are, we are a, a resource for the boards, the three board of trustees are the fiduciaries in it. And we, we work with them, um, as you know, Eric, and uh, um, they, they, are, they set the guidelines on where we're headed with these things. So we'll keep them informed as well. Thank you. Thank you. I won't say pleasure because of what I just said, but thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs>